8. Woman and Work. And unto Adam the Lord said, Cursed be the ground for thy sake, in sorrow shalt thou eat of it all the days of thy life, thorns and thistles shall it bring forth to thee, and thou shalt eat the herbs of the field. In the sweat of thy face shalt thou eat bread, till thou return unto the ground, for dust thou art and into dust thou shalt return. Gen 3, 17-18-19 Upon man was pronounced the curse of the world's work. The Bible declares it was because of his sinfulness that the earth was to be cursed, for his punishment that he was to eat of it in sorrow all the days of his life, because of his wickedness that it was to bear thorns and thistles. And in consequence of his disobedience that he was to eat the herb of the field in the sweat of his face until he returned unto the ground from whence he came. No curse of work was pronounced upon woman. Her curse was of an entirely different character. It was a positive command of the Lord God Almighty, that upon man alone the work of the world should fall and this work he was to perform in sorrow and the sweat of his brow. Thus far this book has been devoted to a consideration of the doctrines taught by Christian men in regard to woman's curse, and so earnestly has this doctrine been proclaimed that man seems to have entirely forgotten the curse, also pronounced upon himself or if he has not forgotten, he has neglected to see its full import. And in his anxiety to keep woman in subordination he has placed his curse also upon her thus thwarting the express command of God. It is therefore but just to new devote a few pages to the consideration of man's curse and an investigation of the spirit in which he has accepted the penalty imposed upon him for his share in the transgression which cost him paradise. At the commencement of this investigation, it will be well to remember that Eve was not banished from the Garden of Eden. Adam alone was cast out and to prohibit his re-entrance, not hers, the angel with the flaming sword was set as guardian at its gates. We must also recall the opposition of the Church through the ages to all attempts made towards the amelioration of woman's suffering at time of her bringing forth children. Upon the plea that such mitigation was a direct interference with the mandate of the Almighty and an inexcusable sin. It will be recalled that in the chapter upon witchcraft, the bitter hostility of the Church to the use of anesthetics by the women physicians of that period was shown, and its opposing sermons, its charges of heresy. Its burnings at the stake as methods of enforcing that opposition. Man, ever unjust to woman, has been no less so in the field of work. He has not taken upon himself the entire work of the world, as commanded, but has ever imposed a large portion of it upon woman. Neither do all men labor. But thousands in idleness evade the curse of work pronounced upon all men alike. The Church in its teachings and through its non-preaching the duty of man in this respect, is guilty of that defiance of the Lord God it has ever been so ready to attribute to woman. The pulpit does not proclaim that this curse of work rests upon any man. Does not preach this command to the idle, the profligate, the rich or the honored but on the contrary shows less sympathy and less respect for the laborer, than for the idle man. The influence of this neglect of its duty by the church has permeated the Christian world, we everywhere find contempt for the man who amid thorns and thistles tills the ground. Obeying his primal curse of earning his bread by the sweat of his brow and everywhere see respect accorded to the man, who by whatever means of honest or of dishonest capacity evades his curse, taking no share in the labors of the field, nor earning his bread in the sweat of his brow. Anesthetics have justly been called the greatest boon ever conferred by science upon mankind. But after the persecution of the witchcraft period a knowledge of their use was lost to the world for many hundred years, but when rediscovered during the present century, their employment in mitigating the sufferings of the expectant mother. Again met with the same opposition as during the Middle Ages upon the same ground of its interference with the curse pronounced by God upon woman. The question of their use at such time was violently discussed at ministerial gatherings, and when Sir James Simpson, physician to Queen Victoria, Employed them at the birth of the later princes and princesses he was assailed by pulpit and press as having sacrilegiously thwarted the curse. When the practice was introduced into the United States, prominent New England clergymen preached against their use upon the same ground, of its being an impious frustration of the curse of the Almighty upon woman. 
but the history of Christendom does not show an instance in which the church or the pulpit ever opposed labor by woman, upon the ground of its being an interference with the curse pronounced upon man. But on the contrary her duty to labor has been taught by church and state alike, having met no opposition, unless, perchance she has entered upon some remunerative employment theretofore monopolized by man. With the purpose of applying its proceeds to her own individual use. Nor has objection then arisen because of the work, but solely because of its money-earning qualities. An investigation of the laws concerning woman, their origin, growth, and by whom chiefly sustained, will enable us to judge how far they are founded upon the eternal principles of justice and how far emanating from ignorance. Superstition and love of power which is the basis of all despotism. Viewing her through the Christian ages, we find woman has chiefly been regarded as an element of wealth. The labor of wife 536 and daughters, the sale of the latter in the prostitution of a loveless marriage, having been an universally extended form of domestic slavery, one which the latest court decisions recognize as still extant. It is the boast of America and Europe that woman holds a higher position in the world of work under Christianity than under pagandom. Heathen treatment of women in this respect of ten forms the subject of returned missionary sermon s from men apparently forgetful that servile labor of the severest and most degrading character is performed by Christian women. Is demanded from them in every Christian country, Catholic, Greek, and Protestant alike, many savage and barbarous races showing superiority over Christian lands in their general treatment of women. England claiming to represent the highest result of Christian civilization shows girls of the most tender years and married women with infants at the breast working in the depths of coal mines nearly naked. Where harnessed to trucks they drag loads of coal on their hands and knees through long low galleries to the pit mouth. Among the pit women in England are those to whom Christianity is not even a name, one to whom the word Christ was spoken, asking, who's him, be he a hodman or a pitman? It has been truthfully declared that England protects its hunting dogs kept for their master's pleasure, far better than it protects the women and children of its working classes. It takes about $2,500,000 annually to pay the maintenance of the 20,000 hounds owned in Great Britain, while women and children are left to slowly die at starvation wages. A few years since a commission was instituted by Parliament to inquire into the condition of women working in the coal mines and the wages paid them. The facts ascertained were of the most horrible character, no improvement being shown in the past fifty years, men and women, boys and girls, still working together in an almost naked condition. In the Lancashire coal fields lying to the north and west of Manchester, females are regularly employed in underground labor. And the brutal conduct of the men and the debasement of the women are well described by some of the witnesses examined by them. Betty Harris, one of numerous persons examined, aged 37, drawer in a coal pit, said, I have a belt around my waist and a chain between my legs to the truck, and I go on my hands and feet. The road is very steep and we have to hold by a rope, and when there is no rope, by anything we can catch hold of. There are six women and about six boys or girls in the pit I work in. It is very wet, and the water comes over our clog tops always, and I have seen it up to my thighs, my clothes are always wet. Patience Kirshaw aged 17, another examined, said, I work in the clothes I now have on, trousers and ragged jacket winky face the bald place upon my head is made by thrusting the cones, the getters I work for are naked, except their caps. They pull off their clothes, all the men are naked. Margaret Hibbs, aged 18, said, My employment after reaching the wall face is to fill my beji or stipe with two and a half or three hundred weight of coal. I then hook it onto my chain and drag it through the seam, which is from 26 to 28 inches high, till I get to the main road, a good distance, probably 200 to 400 yards. The pavement I drag over is wet, and I am obliged at all times to crawl on my hands and feet with my beji hung to the chain and ropes. It is sad, sweating, sore and fatiguing work, and frequently maims the women. Robert Bald, the government coal viewer, states, that, in surveying the workings of an extensive colliery underground, a married woman came forward groaning under an excessive weight of coals, trembling in every nerve, and almost unable to keep her knees from sinking under her. 
On coming up she said, in a plaintive and melancholy voice, Oh sir, this is sore, sore, sore work. A sub-commissioner said, It is almost incredible that human beings can submit to such employment crawling on hands and knees harnessed like horses, over soft, slushy floors, more difficult than dragging the same weight through our lowest sewers. Hundreds of pages are filled with testimony of the same revolting character. These miserable human beings are paid less than 20 cents per day. The evidence shows almost as terrible a condition of the employees of the workshops and large manufacturing establishments. For the same kind of work men are paid three times more wages than are paid to women. Women in the iron trade of the Midlands are compelled, according to a Labour Commission witness, to work in the shed scantily covered and in the summer have to divest themselves of nearly all their clothing while hammering nuts and bolts. They bring their children to the factories and cover them up to prevent their being burnt by red-hot sparks. Often they have to carry bundles of iron weighing half a hundred weight. For such work they earn fours. Or fives. A week, while the men make about fourteen s. As early as 1840 an inquiry into the mining affairs of Great Britain, while showing a pitiable condition of the male laborers, exhibited that of women and children in a much worse light. As the natural guardians of children, well aware of their immaturity of body and mind, no mother allows their employment in severe labor at a tender age unless herself compelled to such work and unable to save her children. But at this investigation, men, women and children were found working together in the pits all either nude or nearly so, and according to the report, not seeing daylight for weeks at a time. Women soon to become mothers were found yoked to carts in the pits, girls carried baskets of coal on their backs up ladders. While mere children crawling like dogs, on hands and feet, hauled carts along narrow rails, the system in operation requiring these victims to remain underground for weeks at a time, breathing foul air and deprived of the light of day. The spirit of ambition is not dead among these wretched serfs, these women working out man's curse. The most degraded woman in the English coal mine will fight for precedence. She has all the force of the man by her side whose religious equal she is not, whose political equal she is not, he possessing those elements of power, entrance to the priesthood and use of the ballot, denied to her. Through the ballot he receives higher wages for the same kind and amount of work the church having taught his superior rights upon every point. Through the ballot he influences the action of government in his own favor to the injury of his fellow workwoman. A few years since the male miners petitioned against the employment of women in the mines, when a clause to that effect was immediately introduced to the coal mine bill, then before Parliament. Although in the Lancashire districts where 164 women were employed, all but 26 were widows or single women entirely dependent upon their own earnings. As severe as the work, the women were remarkable for their bright and healthful appearance as contrasted with the woman workers in the factories of Great Britain. Man, hereditarily unjust to woman under the principles of the patriarchate and the lessons of Christianity, is even more unjust in the fields of work he has compelled her to enter. Then in those of education and the ballot which she is seeking for herself. Organizations, strikes, the eight-hour law demand, are largely conducted by men for men. The grim humor originating the proverb a man's work is from son to son, a woman's work is never done, still clings with all its old force to women in most employments. To such small extent has man made the woman workers cause his own, that instances are to be found even in the United States, where men and women working together and together going out upon a strike. The men have been reinstated at the increase demanded, the women forced to return at the old wages. Nor is our own country the chief sinner in this respect. It was found imperative many years since, among the women of England to organize leagues of their own sex alone, if they desired their own interest in labor to be protected. The male trades unions of that country excluding women from some of the best paid branches of industry, as carpet making, cloth weaving, letter press printing. 537 In Self-Defense, the Woman's Protective and Provident League, and a Woman's Union Labor Journal, were founded. The principle of exclusion has not alone been shown against women's entrance into well-paid branches of work, but in those they have been permitted to enter they have found themselves subjected to much petty annoyance. 
Among the male painters of pottery a combination was formed to prevent the use by woman of the armrests required in this work. Tramway trains carry London workmen at reduced rates, but a combination was entered into by male laborers to prevent women workers from using the low-priced trains. Nor in many instances are employers less the enemies of women, unions having been found necessary for the purpose of moral protection. A most deplorable evidence of the low respect in which woman is held and the slavery that work and cheap wages mean for her, is the suggestion often made by employers that she shall supplement her wages by the sale of her body. The manager of an industrial league in New York City a few years since found that no young girl escaped such temptation. Neither extreme youth nor friendliness afforded security or protection but were rather additional inducements for betrayal, most of the victims numbering but fourteen short years. The late Jenny Collins, of Boston, one of the earliest persons in the United States, to devote herself to this branch of the woman question, said. It is easy for a young girl to obtain employment but let her go where she will. Even in government positions at Washington, she will find her innocence assailed if not made the price at which she gets a chance to work. And that same government does not pay its women employees the same amount of wages for the same kind of work. In the Scottish collieries women are compelled to work in mines filled with gas and flooded with water, 538 little girls commencing work in these collieries at four years of age. And at six carrying loads of 150 pounds upon their backs. Half-clothed women work by the side of entirely nude men, dragging ponderous loads of 16,000 yards a day by means of a chain fastened to a belt, the severe labor of dragging this coal up inclined places to the mouth of the pit. Testing every muscle and straining every nerve. It is a work so destructive to health that even the stoutest men shrink from it, women engaged in it seldom living to be over thirty or forty years of age. A gentleman traveling in Ireland blushed for his sex when he saw the employments of women young and old. He described them as patient drudges, staggering over the bogs with heavy creels of turf on their backs or climbing the slopes from the seashore laden like beasts of burden, with heavy sand dripping seaweed or undertaking long journeys on foot into the market towns bearing heavy hampers of farm produce. Man in thrusting the enforcement of his curse upon woman in Christian lands has made her the great unpaid laborer of the world. In European countries and in the United States, we find her everywhere receiving less pay than man for the same kind and quality of work. A recent statement regarding women workers in the foundries of Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Where 500 women are employed in putting heads on nails and bolts, declared they received less than one half the sum formerly paid to men who did the same kind of work. Women getting from but four to five dollars a week while the wages of men ranged from fourteen to sixteen dollars a week. But as evil as the experience of young women in the world of work, that of old women is in some respects even greater. While the young girl is almost certain to obtain work even if at small wages, it is very difficult for the woman of mature years to obtain work at all, either in households as seamstresses or in manufactories. Societies in the city of New York, for the aid of the working women find it impossible to secure employment for middle-aged women. The report of one such society stated that some of these women managed to procure commitment to the island in order to obtain food and prevent absolute starvation, others slowly died from want of sufficient food. Still others, like the poor hard-working girls of Paris, sought the river as an end to their sufferings. As in the witchcraft period when the chief persecution for many years raged against old women, we still find in our own country that the woman of middle life is the least regarded in her efforts for a livelihood. The reason remains the same. Looked upon during the Christian ages from a sensual standard, the church teaching that woman was made for man still exerts its poisonous influence, still destroys woman. Not alone employers and male laborers oppress woman, but legislation is frequently invoked to prevent her entering certain occupations. The Coal Miners' Bill was one of many instances in Great Britain. Women work there also at making nails, spikes and chains. Not long since legislation prohibiting their entering this branch of work was attempted, when a deputation of women iron workers waited upon the Home Secretary to protest against government interference with their right to earn a livelihood. One of these representative women had entered the work at seven years of age, being then 57. 
Having spent nearly half a century in this occupation she was practically incapacitated for any other form of labor. The terrible condition of working women in Paris, has attracted the attention of the French government. In but three or four trades are they even fairly well paid, and these few require a peculiar adaptation, as well as an expensive training out of reach of most women laborers. And even in these best paid kinds of work, a discrimination in favor of man exists, at the China manufactory at Sevres where the men employed receive a retiring pension, the women do not. From 15 to 18 pence represents the daily earnings of the Parisian working girl, upon which sum it is impossible for her to properly support life. Many of these girls die of slow starvation, others are driven into prostitution, still others seek relief in the same. French women perform the most repulsive labors of the docks. They work in the mines dragging or pushing heavy trucks of coal like their English sisters, through narrow tunnels that run from the seams to the shaft. Eating food of such poor quality that the lessening stature of the population daily shows the result. This decreasing size of Frenchmen especially among the peasantry, the majority not coming up to the regulation army height, has within the last fifteen or twenty years called the tension of the government during conscription. Yet without seeming to teach its cause as lying in the poor food and hard labor of women, the mothers of these men. The heaviest burdens of porters, the most offensive sanitary work, the severest agricultural labor in that country falls upon woman. I pity the women, the donkeys, and the boys, wrote Mrs. Stanton when traveling in the south of France. It is the poor nourishment and excessive labor of woman which makes France today a country of rapidly decreasing birth rate. Seriously affecting its population and calling the earnest attention of statistical bureaus and physicians to this vital question. A question which affects the standing of France among the nations of the earth. According to the report of the Chief of the Statistical Bureau, 1890, there were fewer births than deaths that year, the births amounting to 838,059, the deaths to 876,505, an excess of 38,446 deaths. Commenting upon these returns, der Reichsboot, of Berlin, attributed the cause to a widespread aversion to large families, acknowledging, however, that the lower classes had become weakened and dwarfed by the tasks imposed upon them. What neither the Statistical Bureau, the press, or the church yet comprehend is the fact that the work imposed upon its Christian women, the curse of man thrust upon her, is the chief cause of the lessening size and lessening population of that country. A French gentleman employing a large number of women in a flax factory was appalled at the great amount of infant mortality among the children of his employees. Believing the excessive death rate to be in consequence of the continued labor of women, he released expectant mothers for a month previous, and two months after the birth of a child, with a marked diminution of the death rate. The ordinary food of the peasantry is of poor quality and meager quantity. Those employed in the manufacture of silk largely subsist upon a species of black broth proverbial for its lack of nutritive qualities. The absence of certain elements in food both create specific diseases and inability to combat disease. Vital stamina is closely dependent upon the number of red corpuscles in the blood, the quality of food possessing direct connection with these corpuscles. Dar. Blackwell, of the London Anthropological Society, examined the blood of different races as related to the food eaten by them, finding the number and shape of the red corpuscles to be dependent upon the kind of food eaten. Dar. Richardson, a Philadelphia microscopist, said, any cause which interferes with perfect nutrition may diminish the red corpuscles in number. These corpuscles are recognized as oxygen carriers, therefore any cause which tends to diminish the number of red corpuscles also deprives the system of a portion of the oxygen required for sanitary needs. Blood not fully oxygenated is poisonous to the system. Among the causes recognized by physiologists as creating that alteration in the functions of the body which materially changes the character of the red corpuscles, are poor food, bad air and overwork. These specifically produce blood poisoning, creating new substances in the body that are injurious to the organism. It is not alone in France that such effects are to be noted, although governmental attention has not elsewhere been called to the condition produced, yet twenty years since. 
Fraser's Magazine, in an article on Field Farming Women in England, in reference to the poor food and overwork of women of this class, said of their children, the boys are always very short for their age. Those of fifteen being no larger than town boys of ten. Girls are thin and skinny, angular and bony. Eight years ago, Dr. Rock had, who has given much time to this question, prophesied that the population of France would become stationary before the end of the century. At that time his words carried no weight, he was ridiculed as a vague theorizer, but this result has been reached in one half the time he gave and the results are even of graver character than Dr. Rock had assumed them to be. The balance has already fallen upon the opposite side and in a single year the deaths have outnumbered the births nearly 40,000. 250,000 infants annually die in France because of the impoverished blood, hard work and general innutrition of French mothers. These lives are the more precious to France which can no longer afford to lose them, since in a single year the death rate outnumbered the birth rate 40,000. Through the effort of Dr. Rock had, a society has been organized, rules for feeding infants formulated with penalties attached, and like feudal methods for effecting a change suggested, while the real cause of the lessening population is left untouched. Until the condition of the mother as life-giver is held as sacred under Christianity as it was among the Greeks and Romans, until man taking his own curse upon himself frees woman from its penalties. Until she and her young children are supplied with nourishing food and woman secures pure air to breathe and freedom from the hardship so supremely her lot under existing laws and customs, not until then will a change take place. Parker Pillsbury in Popular Religion, says. Once I journeyed among the magnificent fields, villages and vineyards in the south of France. Women tanned, browned, almost bronzed by the sun, wind and much exposure, weary and worn, many of them mothers, or soon to become such, spaded, shoveled, ploughed, harrowed, often drawing harrows themselves across furrowed fields. They mowed, raked, pitched, loaded and unloaded the hay of the meadows. They harvested the crops and then hastened to haul manure and prepare the ground for other crops, rising early and toiling late, doing almost all kinds of work men do anywhere, and some kinds which neither man nor woman should ever do. Germany, whose women were revered in the centuries before Christianity, now degrades them to the level of beasts. Women and dogs harnessed together are found drawing milk carts in the streets, women and cows yoke draw the plow in the fields. The German peasant wife works on the roads or carries mortar to the top of the highest buildings, while her husband smokes his pipe at the foot of the ladder until she descends for him to again fill the hod. To such extent is woman a laborer that she comes in competition with the railroad and all public methods of traffic. Eight-tenths of the agricultural laborers are women. They plow and sow, and reap the grain and carry immense loads of offal for fertilizing the land. As street cleaners they collect the garbage of towns, work with brooms and shovels to cleanse roadways. And harnessed alone, or with cows or dogs, perform all the most repulsive labors of the fields and streets. Nor for a knowledge of their work are we dependent upon the statements of travelers, but official documents corroborate the worst. An American consul says of a circular upon labor recently issued by the German government, an important factor in the labor of Germany is not inquired of in the circular, viz., the labor of dogs. I have heard it estimated that women and dogs harnessed together do more hauling than the railroads and all other modes of conveyance of goods united. Hundreds of small wagons can be seen every day on all the roads leading to and from Dresden, each having a dog for the near horse harnessed, while the off horse is a woman with her left hand grasping the wagon tongue to give it direction and the right hand passed through. A loop in the rope which is attached to the axle, binding the shoulder, the harnessed woman and dog trudge along together, pulling miraculous loads in all sorts of weather. The pay of woman for this strange, degrading labor is from 10 to 25 cents a day. Nor is that of sewing more remunerative. In March, 1892, a libel suit against an embroidery manufacturer brought to light the fact that women in his employ received but five cents a day. No burden in Germany is considered too heavy for woman until the failing strength of old age necessitates a change of occupation, when amid all verities of weather they take the place of the newsboys of our own country. 
selling papers upon the streets. Munich, the capital of Bavarian Germany, is famed for its treasury of art, paintings, ancient and modern sculptures, old manuscripts of inestimable value, large libraries and splendid architecture make it the seat of the fine arts. But its women are still victims of Christian civilization. Dresden is another city whose art treasures and architectural beauty has rendered it famous among European cities as the German Florence. Yet both of these cities employ women in the same kinds of work under the same repulsive conditions that are found in other portions of that empire. Bavarian men wearing heavy wooden shoes drive their barefooted wives and daughters before the plow in the field, or harnessed with dogs send them as carriers of immense loads of merchandise through the cities. Says a writer. Women become beasts of burden, still they do not grumble, they do not smile either they simply exist. The only liberty they have is liberty to work, the only rest they have is sleep. The existence of a cow or a sheep is a perpetual heaven, while theirs is a perpetual hell. In addition to all this out-of-door labor performed by the German women, they have that of the house and the preparation of clothing for the family. They industriously knit upon the street while doing errands. They cook, they spin and make clothing which takes them afar into the night, rearing their children amid labor so severe as forever to drive smiles from their faces, bringing the wrinkles of premature old age in their place. Switzerland, whose 600th anniversary was celebrated in 1888, the oldest republic, sees its women carrying luggage and blacking boots as porters at inns, propelling heavily laden barges down its romantic lakes. Swinging the scythe by the side of men in the fields, bringing great baskets of hay strapped to their shoulders down the mountainside, carrying litters containing travelers up the same steep mountain top. Bringing heavy baskets of faggots from the forests, and carrying in the more pleasant cutting of grapes at the vineyard harvest. From five o'clock in the morning till eight in the evening is the peasant woman's day of work. A stolid expressionless face, eyes from which no soul seems to look, a magnificent body as strong as that of the man by her side, is the result of the Swiss woman's hardships and work. It is but a few years since the laws of Switzerland compelled division of the paternal estate with sisters as well as brothers, this change provoking intense opposition from the men. On the Alps, husbands borrow and lend their wives, one neighbor not scrupling to ask the loan of another's wife to complete some farming task, which loan is readily granted with the understanding that the favor is to be returned in kind. Says one writer. The farmers in the Upper Alps, though by no means wealthy, live like lords in their houses, while the heaviest portion of agricultural labors devolves upon the wife. It is no uncommon thing to see a woman yoked to a plow with an ass, while her husband guides it. An alpine farmer counts it an act of politeness to lend his wife to a neighbor who has too much work, and the neighbor in return lends his wife for a few days' labor whenever requested. In Vienna, women lay the brick in building, while throughout Austria young girls carry mortar for such work. They also work in the fields, in the mines, pave and clean the streets, or like their German sisters, harnessed with dogs, drag sprinklers for the street or serve milk at the customer's door. Prussian women are also to be found working the mines, in quarries and foundries, building railroads, acting as sailors and boatmen, or like those of Holland, dragging barges in place of horses on the canals. Or like those of other European countries, performing the most severe and repulsive agricultural labors. A correspondent of the Cincinnati Commercial, traveling through Belgium, said, No work seems to be done except by women and dogs. With few exceptions women do the harvesting, working like oxen. The physiological fact that the kind of labor and the kind of food affect the physical frame is noticeable in Belgium the same as in France and England. Women of all ages from 14 to 60, work in the coal mines, married women sometimes carrying babies strapped to their backs into the pit, laying the infants near them while digging coal. Some mine owners refusing to employ a miner unless he can bring one or more members of his family into the pit with him. Employers prefer girls and women because of their lower wages and greater docility, for 12 hours work a woman receives but 30 cents. Even in Little Montenegro, Husbands lend their wives to each other during the harvest season, and an exceptionally strong or quick-moving wife finds exceptional demand for her services. 
This little state degrades woman to still greater extent than her sister countries, as they there form the beasts of burden in war, and are counted among the animals belonging to the prince. The Russian peasant woman under the Greek church finds life equally a burden, and is even to greater extent than in most countries the slave of her husband and the priest. No form of labor or torture being looked upon as too severe to impose upon her. The women are much more industrious than the men and the hardest work is done by them. As Russia is primarily an agricultural country it possesses immense fields of hay, oats and wheat, the work largely performed by women. The wheat sown broadcast is either harvested with sickles or the old-fashioned scythe with a broad blade women do the entire work of gathering up, binding and stacking the wheat, neighbors during harvest helping each other. Women of every age from the young girl to the aged grandmother, take part, assembling at daybreak. Horses are also there in number for carrying food, water, extra implements, and the men and boys of the conclave. The women, however aged, walk. The day's work lasting over eighteen hours or from daybreak until dark, in that northern land at harvest time it continues light from 3 a in to 9.30 p.m. m. Nor are mothers with young infants excused from this toil. Babies are carried into the fields where they lie all day under trees, or partially sheltered by a bough over them, covered with insects from which the mother can find no time to relieve them. Under such circumstances of neglect, it is not surprising that infant mortality is excessive. Nor do the children of a slightly larger growth receive the care requisite for their tender years, and it is estimated that eight out of every ten children in Russia die under ten years of age. But no one form of Christianity monopolizes the wrong. Everywhere, under every name and sect, man has thrown the carrying out of his curse on to woman. Italy, the center of Catholicism, under a careful analysis of statistics, showing that the wages of the Italian working woman do not exceed four pence a day. In Venice a traveler was recently shown some wonderfully beautiful articles of clothing. Scarfs, shawls, mantles, handkerchiefs, many of them requiring six months for the production, expressing amazement at the astonishingly low price demanded for such exquisite fabrics he was told, we pay our young girls but seven cents a day. A correspondent of the Philadelphia Press, writing from abroad in 1885, declared the debasement of woman to be more thorough and complete in Protestant Stockholm than in any city of Northern Europe, as there she supplanted the beasts of burden. He spoke of her as doing all the heavy work on buildings and paid only one kroner, equivalent to a trifle over twenty-six cents, for a hard day of this toil. He found women sweeping the streets, hauling rubbish, dragging handcarts up the hills and over the cobblestones, unloading bricks at the quays, attending to the parks, doing the gardening and rowing the numerous ferries which abound in that city. The entire dairy business of the city is in their hands and here they have the help of neither horses nor dogs but take the entire place of the beasts, carrying the heavy cans of milk on their shoulders from door to door. He said. I am not altogether unfamiliar with woman's work in Europe, I have seen her around the pit mouth, at the forge, and barefoot in the brickyards of Mary England, filling blast furnaces and tending coke ovens in sunny France. I have sadly watched her bearing the heat and burden of the day in the fields of the fatherland, and in Austria-Hungary doing the work of man and beast on the farm and in the mine. I have seen women emerge from the coal pits of busy Belgium, where little girls and young women were underground bearers of coal and drawers of carts. Aged, bent and sunburned, I have seen women with rope over shoulder toiling on the banks of canals and over dikes in picturesque Holland. Having witnessed all this, I was yet surprised to find in a city so beautiful and seemingly so rich as Stockholm, women even more debased. In the Connellsville Coke region of Pennsylvania, United States, the Hungarian woman workers are found engaged in the severest labor under authority of the husband or father, half-nude women drawing the hot coke from the chambers. Master workman Powderly visiting the place early one morning, said of it. At one of the ovens I saw a woman half-naked drawing the coke from one of the chambers. She had no covering on her head and very little on her person. Her appearance was that of one whose spirit had been broken by hardship and hard work. Her attire consisted of a chemise and a pair of cowhide boots. 
In a freight car close by stood another woman forking the coke as it came into the car. The woman stood in the doorway and was dressed in a rough, loose-fitting outer garment and an apron. Her person from the waist up was exposed. When she stooped over to handle the coke, she caught her hair between her teeth in order to keep it out of her way. Her babe which she brought to the works with her, lay in front of the car with scarcely any covering except the shadow of a wheelbarrow which was turned up in order to protect the child from the rays of the sun. The suffering of helpless infants and children from privation and neglect through enforced labor of the mother, is one of the most shocking things connected with this degradation of woman in labor. The ownership by the husband of the wife's services, his power under the Christian law of church and state of compelling her to work for him. The public sentiment of church and state which not alone recognizes absolute authority over the wife as inhering in the husband, but which are the creators of such belief, are the causes of illness, death, moral degradation, insanity. Crime and vice of every kind. One year even, of civilized housekeeping with its routine of washing, starching, ironing, scrubbing, cooking, baking, pickling, canning, sewing, sweeping, house cleaning, etc., etc., with all their accompanying overheating and overlifting. The care of children both night and day, whether sick or well, the constant demands upon her time and strength, thrown upon women of the Christian household. Our labors more severe than fell on the old-time savage woman of America during her whole life. Until the customs of civilization reached the Indians, their wives, according to Catlin, Schoolcraft and others, were not called upon to work with half the severity of the women of today, nor had they tradition of children ever born deaf, dumb or blind. Those kinds of labor pointed to as showing the hardships of an Indian woman's life, Schoolcraft dismisses very lightly. The lodge built by her is not made of heavy posts and carpentry, but of thin poles bent over at the top, such as a child can lift. When a family changed its residence these poles were not removed. Only the thin sheets of birch bark covering, were taken to the new rendezvous. The gathering of the fuel by the women, was cutting dry limbs of the forest not over eighteen inches in length, with a hatchet. The tillage of the fields shared alike by the old men, women and the boys, was very light. No oxen to drive, no plow to hold, no wheat to plant or thresh. The same corn hills were used year after year, forming small mounds that were long a puzzle to the antiquarian. The squash and the pumpkin grew luxuriantly, while the children made holidays of gathering nuts and acorns for winter use. And today Africa, the dark continent, is the children's paradise, says Mrs. French Sheldon, the wonderful woman explorer, who carried peace with her everywhere and whose investigations in that part of the world exceed in value those of Livingstone or Stanley. She says, In all these months among the children every day, I never saw a child struck and I heard a child cry but twice while on the dark continent. How different from the countries of Christian civilization where children, mere infants of three and four years, are put to the most severe labor or because of the mother's enslaved condition, die from neglect. It will be said, but these instances, especially in the United States, are exceptional. This is not so, although the work performed may be of a different character. The wife even in this country is expected to understand and perform many kinds of labor. She is cook and baker, laundress and seamstress, nurse for her children and the sick, besides a thousand and one cares which rise before her every hour. One such overworked mother acknowledged to placing the cradle where the sun would shine in the baby's eyes, thus compelling them to close, when she would push all out of the way underneath the bed. Said a German girl working, as help, in the modern kitchen of a well-to-do American family. I plowed at home harnessed beside a cow, and the work was not as hard as in your hot kitchen. The care of children and domestic labor are not compatible with each other. One must be neglected, and she of whom, meals on time are demanded, can say where the neglect necessarily falls. A consistent carrying out by man of his, curse, would cause him to take upon himself the entire work of the world, not alone tilling the soil, but all household labor. The baking and brewing, the cooking and cleaning and all the multitudinous forms of work which make such wearisomely incessant demands upon woman's strength and time. From all sewing, knitting, crocheting, embroidering, she should be freed, 
and even beyond this, under the principles of his curse, upon man should fall all the work of rearing children. As woman's curse so often quoted does not refer to aught but bringing them to life in sorrow and suffering. Custom, which has been defined as unwritten law, adds its force to legislative enactments and soon becomes as binding upon thought as a moral command. People soon cease to question a custom, or a law, accepting both in that conservative spirit so utterly destructive to liberty. For that reason what has long been so, is regarded as right, and even while regretting the neglect of her children so unavoidable to the ordinarily situated mothers, few women give thought to the cause bringing it about. Women are not sufficiently permeated with the meaning of personal liberty. They do riot sufficiently investigate the causes of their restricted condition, and the break made within the past twenty-five to forty years against conditions, has rather been in the nature of a blind instinctive revolt. Then brought about through philosophic thought except in the minds of a few, who by the protest of speech, opened the way that vast multitudes are now entering upon. Open rebellion against law is ever considered by the majority as rebellion against morality. Speaking of the moral influence of law, Sheldon Amos says, As soon as a law is made and lifted out of the region of controversy, it begins to exercise a moral influence which is no less intense and widespreading for being almost imperceptible. Though law can never attempt to forbid all that is morally wrong, yet that gets to be held as morally wrong which the law forbids. No less does unwritten law come to be regarded as morally right. The customs of society built up through teachings of the church, and laws of the state, have destroyed that sense of personal security among women which is the chief value of social life and of law. The very foundation of religion tends to this end even with man, but the division of rights and duties promulgated by the church as between man and woman. The changing form of laws class legislation has rendered the position of woman notably insecure. This usurpation is productive of immense loss to the state as France so clearly shows. Take the one article of food alone, the delicacies and the substantials alike are claimed by man. No proof of this statement other than the innumerable saloons and restaurants chiefly supported by men, is required. While the dairyman, the bird fancier, the horse trainer, and even the pugilist, recognize the value of food as far as a factor of life and strength, where his own immediate money interest is concerned, neither governments. Religions nor scientists have to any extent noted the influence of proper food for the mother upon the health and life of the unborn child. Victor Hugo, while upon the island of Guernsey, noted the vastly beneficial effect that even one good meal a week had upon the peasant children. Food, building muscles, nerves, the brain, what can be expected but a deterioration of humanity when mothers eat insufficient or improper food? The effect of the kind of food eaten has recently been noted in the new industry of ostrich farming, in California, of which it is said, ostriches yield the best feathers if the birds are well cared for. The quality of the plumes depends upon the quality of the food. If the ostriches are well fed, their plumes are soft and big. Bad feeding makes the feathers hard and coarse. Nor are animals from whom the best products are looked for, allowed to labor. Their lives are those of ease and comfort that best results may be obtained. Innutrition and the hard labor of expectant mothers are, the two great factors in physical degeneration and infantile mortality. The question is not one of sentiment or of law or of religion, but of physiology. It does not alone involve the destiny of mothers but of the race. There is not a national problem, be it of war or population or finance that is not based upon the condition of woman. Its neglect has depopulated the world in times past, it has lessened intellectual development, it has almost entirely obliterated certain kinds of morality and can no longer be regarded from the standard of either of those great institutions. Church or State the recent official report of the factory inspector of the state of New York upon the condition of working women, showed a condition quite in line with the worst features of foreign lands. Overwork, bad ventilation, low wages, poor food, all combining for their physical and moral destruction. The churchman under heading of, in darkest New York, speaks of the condition of the poor in that city, both men and women. But while not forgetting the wrongs of the male laborer, we must ever remember that the condition of woman is still lower, 
and the results of her severe work in semi-starvation, much more injurious to the world. We must leave the tenements without attempting to reproduce any of the shocking cases of crowded rooms in which almost incredible numbers of poor wretches are huddled together even in summer, when Mr. Reese has found the thermometer rise to 115 degrees. In some of these places there is more than struggle, there is often starvation. Every once in a while a case of downright starvation gets into the papers and makes a sensation. But this is the exception. Were the whole truth known it would come home to the community with a shock that would arouse it to a more serious effort than the spasmodic undoing of its purse strings. I am satisfied that hundreds of men, women and children are every day slowly starving to death with my medical friend's complaint of improper nourishment. Within a single week I have had this year three cases of insanity provoked directly by poverty and want. Worse than even that is the evil case of thousands of ill-fated working girls. The average wages of 150,000 of them is 60 cents per day. And that includes the incomes of the stylish cashiers, who earn $2 a day as well as the pittance of girls who earn 30 cents a day in east side factories. The lot of the average saleswoman who does not partly depend on her family is hard indeed. That the average wages of the 150,000 working girls in the city of New York alone are but 60 cents a day, some receiving as little as 30 cents in the cast side factories. That 30,000 young girls between the ages of 12 and 14 employed as cash girls cannot supply themselves with food unless having parents upon whom to partially depend, are no less moral than material questions. Nor are they questions confined to that one city, or to any one portion of the United States, or of Christendom, but belong to humanity itself. As all are parts of one great whole, the evil that afflicts one class touches all. All suffer because of the wrong done to even one human being, the population of the city of New York is more largely comprised of women than of men and a great proportion of this class are dependent upon their own labor for a livelihood. Although many foreign-born women emigrate to this country, over two millions having landed upon our shores within the nine years from 1881 to 1890, it is not alone upon them these conditions of severe labor fall, but native-born American women. Both within and without the household, suffer from the same kind of oppression. Even upon the Pacific coast where few foreigners except Chinese are found, little girls of five and six years are put to work in the jute mills and factories by side of their drudging mothers, whose wages do not equal those of the men employed. In government clerkships at Washington, women receive but one-half the pay that men receive for the same kind and quality of work. Although the sweating system in the manufactories of clothing has called the nation's attention to its abuses, yet in the District of Columbia, under sole power of Congress, a system of similar nature exists. Nor are statistics of women's severe work in the United States of immediately recent date. The Labor Commission Report of the State of Connecticut for 1876, declaring that the wives and daughters of the farmer engage in work which he can find no man to do, rising at four o'clock in the morning and working until nine in the evening. Analyzing the statistics of the Massachusetts Labor Bureau for 1891, the Boston Globe showed the greatly inferior payment of women laborers. The figures simply show that in the employments in which the very lowest wages are paid, women constitute over 70 percent of the workers, while in the employments where as high as $20 a week are paid, they constitute hardly over 3 percent. In addition to all this is the humiliating fact that in some occupations, standing side by side with men, the females are paid less wages for the same work. Or, what amounts to the same thing? A woman of 20 years or upwards is made to work side by side with a boy of 10 at the same wages. Women are compelled, then, to fill most of the cheap places, and paid less wages for the same work at that. In this report the shameful fact is proven through governmental statistics that the wages paid to a girl of 20 years are no more than those paid a boy of 10, women constituting over 70%. Of the workers to whom the very lowest wages are paid. Underlying all other results are those upon woman herself. Before every question of population, is that of woman as an individual. Overwork and the undernourishment of muscle, nerve, brain, render her own proper evolution either as a physical or as a moral being impossible. 
To just the extent that such pressure comes upon her, does she cease to be a morally responsible being. Thousands to whom life and comforts are sweet, throw aside all scruples, entering that one avenue of escape always open to a young woman or a girl. For the statement that the majority of women entering upon immorality have been driven by actual want to this mode of life, we are again indebted to rigorous investigation and statistics for information. But the moral deterioration of the race arising from these wrongs to women cannot be estimated by figures. In teaching, the only absolute equality of wages between man and woman is found in the Cherokee nation of Indians. The civilization of the Indian tribes is a question of woman's education and freedom. The world still holds a mistaken idea of force and power, those questions not so fully pertaining to the physical as to the intellectual and spiritual parts of the being. The New York Nation recently said, it is absolutely essential to the preservation of the dignity and independence of women that they should be on a par with men as regards property and education. The two things that in modern times have supplanted physical force as elements of power. Real estate possesses more power as property than either money or jewels. The real strength of American civilization lies in the fact that almost every family owns its home. Permanent national strength lies in the division of realty. In England women are more rapidly becoming part of the governing class than in the United States, and in that country one-seventh of the landed property owners are women. These facts should be borne in mind in regard to the civilization of the native races of America. It is through the Indian women that the problem of their civilization must be answered. The title and fee simple to lands should be in the hands of the women. The union of the state with the church in the enforcement of man's curse upon woman is most forcibly shown by a decision of the New York Court of Appeals rendered early in 1892 which held that the services of a wife belong to the husband and that she cannot recover wages from him even if holding his written promise to pay. This decision like that of the Agarellis case in England, was upon the principle that the wife is so fully under subjection to her husband as to incapacitate her from making a contract even with that husband. In all the wife's relations to the husband she is regarded as a being without responsibility. The case upon which this decision rested is this, a woman fell down a coal hole and sued for damages, recovering $500. The defendant asked for a new trial upon the ground that the woman was working for her husband and the court had taken into account her loss of wages. The services of the wife belonging to the husband, her claim for lost wages was a fraud. But this decision of the Court of Appeals doubtless will not interfere with the power of the husband to recover damages for loss of her time by reason of this injury which deprived him of her services. The decision of the court recognized the right of the husband to compel the wife to perform household duties for him. When in England, 1880, the Married Woman's Property Rights Bill was before Parliament, a commission of inquiry was sent to New York to learn the effect of securing the control of their own property to married women. Under various amendments since the first passage of this Act in 1848, the Legislature of New York has farther secured to married women the right of making wills, of collecting wages for work, and of entering business outside of the household. The proceeds belonging entirely to herself. But under this decision of the Court of Appeals, the ground was taken that the wife cannot collect wages from the husband, and that household work for him is compulsory upon her. 539 This decision as to compulsory housework controverts that other right recognized by legislation, of entering into business, doing work outside of the home, the proceeds to belong solely to herself. Under this decision of the Court of Appeals, a wife can be compelled to work for the husband in the house without wages, and is debarred from all outside business. St. Augustine in his, City of God, taunts Rome with having caused her own downfall by her treatment her slaves. He speaks of the slaves as miserable beings put to labor only fit for the beasts of the field and even degraded below them. Their condition had brought Rome to its own destruction. But Roman wives were not forced to labor. The peace made by the Sabines with the Romans after the forcible abduction of the Sabine maidens, had for one of its provisions that no labor except spinning should be required from wives. Among both the ancient Greeks and Romans, the woman about to become a mother, as heretofore shown, was held sacred, she was exempt from hard labor and no one was allowed under penalty of punishment, 
to vex or disturb her mind. If degrading their slaves below the beasts of the field led to the destruction of Rome, as declared by Augustine, what may not be predicted of that Christian civilization which in the twentieth century of its existence degrades women and children to such labors as, he declared unfit for the slaves of ancient Rome, suitable only for the beasts of the field, which harnesses them by side of cows, asses, and dogs to do the most menial work, which robs them in wages and stints them in food in the name of religion. 9. The Church of Today While under advancing civilization, a recognition of the religious rights of woman is steadily progressing among people at large. It requires but slight investigation to prove that olden church theories regarding her not only came into the Reformation, but largely remain the same today. The Christianity of the ages having taught the existence of a superior and an inferior sex possessing different rights in the Christian church, held accountable to different codes of morals. It is not strange that we do not find morality to have been more of a fundamental principle among the pastors of early Protestant churches than in the Catholic priesthood. The doctrine of, once in grace, always in grace, carries with it a plea for vice, and the early experience of strict Calvinistic Scotland was much that of medieval Catholic Europe. The Presbyterian conventicles 540 early bore an extremely evil reputation. The fact that ministers of the Reformed Church were permitted marriage did not change priestly teaching that woman was created solely for man, and they found apologies in the Bible for illicit conduct. These Protestant clergymen taught, as had the Catholic, that a priest was incapable of sinning, and from the Sermon on the Mount, to the pure all things are pure, was quoted in proof of this assertion. Even when under circumstances of great personal peril and danger to life, the trust of parishioners in the morality of their shepherds was often abused, of this, Rev. David Williamson, one of the most eminent Presbyterian ministers of Edinburgh, was a conspicuous example. In defense of his immorality Mr. Williamson said, Verily, I do not deny that with a stee. Paul the first have a law in my members warring against the law of my mind, and bringing me into captivity unto the love of sin which is in my members. The strangest sermons, most insulting to woman and too indecorous for quotation, were constantly preached, while her inferiority and incapacity for understanding even the gospel was also as constantly declared from the pulpit. An old Presbyterian preacher, Rev. David Douglas, discovering a woman weeping in the kirk, pointed toward her, crying, Wife, what makes you weep? I am sure thou understandeth not what I am saying. My discourse is directed to the brethren and not to the like of you. The present century, with all its enlightenment does not cease to give us glimpses of that favorite medieval doctrine that sin can be killed with sin as the best way of becoming innocent again, and its concomitant. That it is impossible for a person in grace to commit sin. 541 The doctrines of holiness and entire sanctification, taught by some sects today, and the theory that all experience is necessary in order to a full development of character, are of the same nature. Eastern, wisdom religion, declares that a person can become neither God nor Deva without passing through all experience, returning again and again to earth for this purpose. The departure of the soul atom from the bosom of the divinity is a radiation from the life of the great all, who expends his strength in order that he may grow again and live by its return. God thereby acquires new vital force, provided by all the transformation that the soul atom has undergone. Its return is its final reward. Such is the secret of the evolution of the great being and of the supreme soul. 542. Directions for seeking out the way. Seek it not by any one road, to each temperament there is one road which seems the most desirable. But the way is not found by devotion alone, by religious contemplation alone, by ardent progress, by self-sacrificing labor, by studious observation of life. None can take the disciple more than one step onward. All steps are necessary to make up the ladder, one by one, as they are surmounted. The virtues of men are steps indeed, necessary not by any means to be dispensed with. Yet, though they create a fine atmosphere and happy future, they are useless if they stand alone. The whole nature of man must be used wisely by the one who desires to enter the way. Each man is to himself absolutely the way, the truth and the life. 
seek it by plunging into the mysterious and glorious depths of your own inmost being. Seek it by testing all experience, by utilizing the senses in order to understand the growth and meaning of individuality and the beauty and obscurity of those other divine fragments which are struggling side by side with you. And form the race to which you belong. 543. The Catholic and Calvinistic doctrines of woman's inferiority of position and intellect taught from the pulpit, are by no means relegated to past centuries, but continue to be publicly taught by the Protestant clergy of every sect. As fully as by their Catholic and Greek brethren. The first National Woman Suffrage Convention which assembled in Washington, 1869, having invited Rev. Chaplain Gray, of the House, to open its proceedings with prayer, he referred in this petition to woman as an afterthought of the Creator, an inferior and secondary being, called into existence for the special benefit of man. The noble old Quakeress, Lucretia Mott, sitting in an attitude of devout attention, suddenly raised her head, and at close of the prayer, Bible in hand, she read aloud the account of the creation, Genesis I. 27-28, Woman and Man Equals, both having been given dominion over nature. The thirtieth anniversary of the first public demand of woman for the recognition of her equality of right with man, held in Rochester, N. Y. July 18, 1878, passed a series of resolutions 544 asserting woman's equality and religious rights with man. Three of these proved especially obnoxious to the clergy of the country, in declaring the first duty of every individual to be self-development the duty of every woman to be guided by her own reason rather than the authority of another. And that it was owing to the perversion of the religious element in woman that she had been so completely subjugated to priestcraft and superstition. Resolved, that as the first duty of every individual is self-development, the lessons of self-sacrifice and obedience taught to woman by the Christian Church have been fatal, not only to her own vital interests, but through her. To those of the race. Resolved. That the great principle of the Protestant Reformation, the right of individual conscience and judgment heretofore exercised by men alone, should now be claimed by woman. That, in the interpretation of Scripture, she should be guided by her own reason, and not by the authority of the Church. Resolved, that it is through the perversion of the religious element in woman playing upon her hopes and fears of the future. Holding this life with all its high duties in abeyance to that which is to come that she and the children she has borne have been wrongfully subjugated by priestcraft and superstition. These resolutions immediately called forth a sermon in opposition from the Rev. A. H. Strong, D. D. President of the Rochester Theological Seminary, Baptist, in which he said. She is subordinate to man in office, she is to be helper, not principal. Therefore man has precedence in the order of creation, woman is made of man, and to supply the felt need of man. The race, therefore, is called the race of man and not the race of woman. For this office of subordination and whether they assert it or not, women are fitted by their very constitution, and in the very creation of mankind in the garden of beauty undefiled by the slimy track of the serpent as it was. God ordained the subordination of woman and the differences of nature that makes her subordination inevitable. The power of rule seems to me to have been invested in the head of the family that he may act for them, or rather that they may act through him. The assertion of this theologian that, the race therefore is called the race of man and not the race of woman, is of the same character as that of Inquisitor Sprenger in regard to the word femina, as applied to woman showing the intellectual caliber of both inquisitor and theologian to be the same. But in their assertion of woman's inferiority in subordination, neither Chaplain Gray nor President Strong proceeded quite as far as an opposing speaker at the Philadelphia Woman Suffrage Convention of 1854, who said, Let woman first prove that she has a soul, both the Bible and the Church deny it. Here we are set back to the Macon Council of the 6th century, which debated the question of woman's humanity. That the Church of the 19th century possesses the same character as that of the 14th, the 12th, the 5th, was forcibly illustrated during the early days of the anti-slavery struggle. Especially in its persecution of the women who took part in that reform. Lucretia Mott and Esther Moore were integral members of the American Anti-Slavery Society, having assisted in the convention which organized this society in 1833. 
Shortly afterward the Grimke sisters of South Carolina, Sarah and Angelina, convinced of the sinfulness of slavery, left their delightful home in Charleston, and coming north spoke eloquently through Massachusetts against those wrongs of which they themselves had been witnesses. The Church, becoming frightened at woman's increasing power and influence, determined to crush her work. Its action began with the Orthodox Congregational, at that time the largest and most influential ecclesiastical body of Massachusetts. And in 1837 the General Association of Massachusetts issued a pastoral letter calling upon all churches under their care to defend themselves by closing their doors against the abolitionists, who had set aside the laws of God by welcoming women to their platforms and allowing them to speak in public. 545 Section 3rd was the most significant portion of this pastoral letter. 3. We invite your attention to the dangers which at present seem to threaten the female character with widespread and permanent injury. The appropriate duties and influence of woman are clearly stated in the New Testament. Those duties and that influence are unobtrusive and private, but the source of mighty power. When the mild, dependent, softening influence of woman under the sternness of man's opinions is fully exercised, society feels the effects of it in a thousand forms. The power of woman is her dependence, flowing from the consciousness of that weakness which God has given her for her protection, and which keeps her in those departments of life that form the character of individuals and of the nation. There are social influences which females use in promoting piety and the great objects of Christian benevolence which we cannot too highly commend. We appreciate the unostentatious prayers and efforts of women in advancing the cause of religion at home and abroad, in Sabbath schools, in leading religious inquirers to the pastors for instruction. And in all such associated effort as becomes the modesty of her sex, and earnestly hope that she may abound more and more in these labors of piety and love. But when she assumes the place and tone of man as a public reformer, our care and protection of her seem unnecessary, we put ourselves in self-defense against her. She yields the power which God has given her for her protection, and her character becomes unnatural. If the vine whose strength and beauty is to lean upon the trellis work, and half conceal its clusters, thinks to assume the independence and the overshadowing nature of the elm, it will not only cease to bear fruit, but fall in shame and dishonor into the dust. We cannot, therefore, but regret the mistaken conduct of those who encourage females to bear an obtrusive and ostentatious part in measures of reform, and countenance any of that sex who so far forget themselves as to itinerate in the character of public lecturers and teachers. We especially deplore the intimate acquaintance and promiscuous conversation of females with regard to things which ought not to be named, by which that modesty and delicacy which is the charm of domestic life, and which constitutes the true influence of woman in society is consumed, and the way opened, as we apprehend, for degeneracy and ruin. We say these things not to discourage proper influences against sin, but to secure such reformation as we believe is scriptural, and will be permanent. That we may rightly judge the character of this pastoral letter, it must be remembered, that no discussion upon what is known as, the woman question, took place at those meetings, which were, entirely devoted to the southern slave. This letter was written by men, emanating from a body of Christian people that sustained colored slavery as an institution upon which God had as equally placed his sanction, as upon the subordination of woman. To such extent have the conscience and will been under the bondage of the priesthood, that the more timid members of the anti-slavery society became frightened, even some, of those who believed in woman's equality advising these speakers to yield their rights in the meetings, lest the ministers who had joined them should withdraw, taking others with them. Thus priestly intolerance and the timidity of anti-slavery men, had the effect of silencing the philanthropic and eloquent Grimke sisters 546, in their efforts, for the freedom of the slave. After ten months' work, their voices were heard no more. These sisters were not only persecuted in the north, under ban of the church, but in the south the state united with the church, and by a decree of the city of Charleston they were rendered permanent exiles from home. And informed that should they return despite this, they would not be able to escape personal violence from a mob. With one noble exception, this mandate of the church and clergy had effect for a time in silencing woman's plea for the slave. 
For seven long years the voice of but one woman, that of Abby Kelly, 547 was heard upon the anti-slavery platform, and the persecutions of the church made her life one long martyrdom. Her appeals for the slave were met by mob violence, furious howls, cries, and the vilest language being supplemented by more material efforts for silencing her voice. Were these proceedings not so thoroughly substantiated, the time so shortly passed, credence could not be given as to the means used against this noble woman to prevent her pleading for those so greatly wronged. 548 ministers of high standing assailed her from the pulpit, a favorite text being, Revelations, 2-20. I have a few things against thee, because thou sufferest that woman, Jezebel, which calleth herself a prophetess, to teach and seduce my servants to commit fornication. Not alone the congregational body, but all Christian sects, were imbued with the same persecuting spirit, a Methodist presiding elder characterizing the Garrisonian societies, as no longer anti-slavery, but, no government, no Sabbath, no church. No Bible, no marriage, woman's right societies. That woman had assumed the right to speak in public for the oppressed was the origin of all this vituperation. Its real cause was of the same nature as that which laid thirty thousand heads low, at his tea. Bartholomew, that woman's voice had been heard in public contrary to the teaching of the church. It was perhaps foreseen that she might, as really at a later period was done, draw a vivid illustration of the similitude between the condition of the white wife and the black slave. 549 The Unity and Peace of the World's Anti-Slavery Convention, London, 1840, was disturbed by the hostility of several clergymen, and a few bigoted laymen of the same spirit who objected to the recognition of the women delegates sent by several American societies, among whom were Lucretia Mott and Esther Moore, members of the parent organization. After a spirited discussion their admission was decided to be a violation of the ordinances of Almighty God, and their credentials were rejected. 550. In 1843, the Hopkinson Association of Congregational Divines, of New Hampshire, unanimously enacted a statute in opposition to women opening their lips in church, even to sigh, or groan, in contrition. Doubtless agreeing with Minister Douglas, that they were incapable of understanding a discourse directed to the brethren, who alone were allowed to shout, Amen, bless the Lord, and glory. By a strange inconsistency women were still allowed to sing, under men as leaders. This statute of restriction declared. But, as to leading men either in instruction or devotion, and as to any interruption or disorder in religious meetings, let your women keep silence in the churches. Not merely let them be silent, but let them keep or preserve silence. Not that they may not preach, or pray, or exhort merely, but they may not open their lips to utter any sounds audibly. Let not your women in promiscuous religious meetings preach or pray audibly, or exhort audibly, or sigh, or, groan, or say Amen, or utter the precious words, Bless the Lord, or the enchanting sounds, Glory! Glory! In 1888, forty-five years after this statute, Rev. Dr. Theodore L. Coiler in the New York Evangelist, gave his opinion in regard to woman's action in reform work and her demand for a share in making the laws which govern her, in this wise. We can say frankly to our temperance brethren, that if they attempt to lash the wise project of prohibition of saloons and the foolish project of female suffrage inseparably together, they will encounter fatal opposition. They will repel tenfold more sensible voters than they will win. Their most eloquent and logical advocate, Dr. Herrick Johnson, is intensely opposed to the Lucy Stone and Elizabeth Cady Stanton doctrines of woman suffrage, as I am. Nineteen twentieths of our Presbyterian ministers will never cast a vote which is nominally only for prohibition, and yet is really a vote for burdening womanhood with civil government. What is true of our Church is true of the Episcopal, Reformed, Baptist, Congregationalist, and the most influential portion of the Methodist Church. The same year of President Strong's opposing sermon, 1878, the United Presbyterian Assembly passed a resolution to the effect that they found no sufficient authority in Scripture to warrant the ordination of women as deacons. Yet they might with profit to themselves, and great advantage to the cause of suffering humanity, and for Christ, be allowed to act as assistants to deacons. 
thus emphasizing the dominant church teaching of woman's irresponsibility and secondary position to man. The same year, however, an advanced step was taken in Europe, the Synod of Born, Old Catholic, following the example of Per Hyacinth, adopted a resolution in favor of the marriage of the clergy by a vote of 76 to 22. At the same time the Old Catholics were taking this advanced step, the Protestant Episcopal Diocesan Convention of South Carolina forbade women's voting upon church matters. Although it was proven during the discussion that in some parishes there were but five male members. The Southern Baptist Convention, held in Savannah, Georgia, 1885, appointed a committee with title of, and whose business was to decide upon, representation by women, in church affairs. This committee reported in favor of the word brethren, instead of members, being incorporated in the Constitution, thus confirming the right of man alone to take part, in church. Councils. Having thus effectively closed the lips of women on discussion of church questions, the convention introduced a resolution on Divorce 551 followed by a speech declaring that but one cause could exist. The convention having shut off all chance for woman's opinion upon this question of equal and even of more vital interest to her, applaudingly and overwhelmingly adopted the resolution. At the annual election for Officers of Christ Church, New Haven, Connecticut, April 1886, a discussion arose upon the right of women to become members of the society and consequently voters in it. Several ladies having signified a desire to unite with the society, Bishop Williams was consulted as to their admission. He decided the canon was clearly against them, and on motion of the clerk their application was rejected, only one member speaking in favor. The title of the sermon still preached upon woman, illustrate priestly thought regarding her. Among those of recent date are found, blighted women, sins of women, women in divorce, women and skepticism, woman's place and work, our common mother, the relation of husband and wife, marriage and divorce, the sphere of woman. Husband and wife, a mission for women, the church and the family, the duties of wives to husbands, these sermons all subordinating woman to man in every relation of life. All designed to repress woman's growing tendency towards freedom, and her claim for the same opportunities in life conceded to man. That the clerical teaching of woman's subordination to man was not alone a doctrine of the Dark Ages, is proven by the most abundant testimony of today. The famous sea trial of 1876, which shook not only the Presbytery of Newark, but the whole Synod of New Jersey, and finally the General Presbyterian Assembly of the United States, was based upon the doctrine of the divinely appointed subordination of woman to man, and arose simply because Rev. Dr. Isaac C. admitted two ladies to his pulpit to speak upon temperance, Rev. Dr. Craven, the prosecutor, declared this act to have been an indecency in the sight of Jehovah. He expressed the general clerical and church view, when he said, I believe the subject involves the honor of my God. I believe the subject involves the headship and crown of Jesus. Woman was made for man and became first in the transgression. My argument is that subordination is natural, the subordination of sex. Dr. C. has admitted marital subordination, but this is not enough, there exists a created subordination. A divinely arranged and appointed subordination of woman as woman to man as man. Woman was made for man and became first in the transgression. The proper condition of the adult female is marriage, the general rule for ladies is marriage. Women without children, it might be said, could preach, but they are under the general rule of subordination. It is not allowed woman to speak in the church. Man's place is on the platform. It is positively base for a woman to speak in the pulpit. It is base in the sight of Jehovah. The whole question is one of subordination.552. Thus before a vast audience largely composed of women, Dyar. Craven stood and with denunciatory manner, frequently bringing his fists or his Bible emphatically down, devoted a four-hour speech to proving that the Bible taught woman subordination to man. His arguments were the same as those of the church in the past and were based upon the same theory, viz. That woman was created inferior to man, for man, and was the first in sin. He referred to the fashions as aid in his argument, saying. In every country, under every clime, 
from the peasant woman of Naples, with a handkerchief over her hair, to the women before me with bonnets, every one wears something upon her head in token of subordination. Dar. Craven made this statement in direct contradiction to, historical facts which prove that the head covering is always removed in presence of a superior. To remain bareheaded is an act of deference to a higher authority. Even the Quaker custom of men's wearing the hat in meeting, originated as an act of defiance to the Anglican Church. Dr. Craven also forgot to state that flowing hair has always been regarded as an emblem of superiority and freedom. Clipped hair that of a slave or prisoner. Thus Dar. Craven's appeal to fashion reacted against him in the minds of all historically informed persons, yet together with his other statements it was fully endorsed by most of his brother clergymen present, some of whom enthusiastically shouted, Amen. At the close of his speech several other clergymen gave their views. Dr. Ballantyne considered the subject too simple for an argument. Dar. Few Smith, although he admired Miss Smiley, more than almost any orator he had ever listened to, did not want her or any other woman to permanently occupy the Presbyterian pulpit. Dar. Wilson rejoiced to see so many women crowding in the lecture room, but Brother C. should not take all the glory to himself. He was glad to see the women take so deep an interest in the subject under discussion. But as he looked at them he asked himself, what will all the children do while these women are away from home? A decision of censure against Dr. C. was agreed in by the Synod of New Jersey, and confirmed by the General Assembly of the Presbyterian Church of the United States, in session at Pittsburgh. Thus we find that the Christianity of today continues to teach the existence of a superior and an inferior sex in the Church, possessing different rights and held accountable to a different code of morals. Not alone did Dar. Craven expressed the idea that woman's very dress was typical of her inferiority, but the right Reverend Dr. Cox, Bishop of the Western, Episcopal, Diocese of New York refused the sacrament in 1868 to the lady patients of the Clifton Springs Sanitarium whose heads were uncovered. Although the chapel was under the same roof and on the same floor with the patients' rooms. This same right Reverend Dr. Cox, in a speech at his installation as first president of the Ingham Seminary for Young Ladies, declared the laws of God to be plainly salic. Reverend W. W. Patton, D. D., President of Howard University, Washington, D. C. In a sermon preached at the Congregational Church, upon Woman and Skepticism, January, 1885, advanced the proposition that as soon as they, women, depart from their natural sphere, they become atheistical and immoral. 553 In March, 1891, a half-column editorial in the Presbyterian discussed the ethics and aesthetics of woman's dress at communions, not precisely in line with Dr. Cox, yet of the same general character as to regulating woman's dress, in, should women receive the elements at communion with gloved hands? Some authorities objected, to the practice upon the ground, that nothing might come, between the recipient and the mystic power contained in the bread and wine after consecration by the priest, but while, as the editor remarks, it is after all a very small matter, it is in a historical aspect, a great one, showing such pronounced change from the church teaching of but a few centuries since. When women were forbidden to take the Eucharist in their naked hands because of their impurity. Reverend Mr. Denhurst, member of the Connecticut Legislature, House, during a hearing before a committee upon that question March, 10, 1886. While speaking favorably of woman suffrage still betrayed his belief in the old theological idea that women brought sin into the world through which her subordination to man ensued. But like Dr. C. he limited this subordination to married women, saying, As a minister of the gospel, I deny that you can find anywhere in the Bible, woman's subordination till she sent the curse of sin upon the world, and that relates only to married women, and marriage is a matter of choice. The spiritual and temporal superiority of man over woman is affirmed by clergymen of the present day as strongly as by those of the Dark Ages, and sermons in opposition to her equality of rights are as frequently preached. The entrance of woman into remunerative industries is as energetically opposed as is her demand for governmental and religious freedom. Rev. 
Morgan Director of Trinity Church, New York, in a series of Lenten Lectures, 554 a few years since, made woman the subject of violent attacks as an inferior and subordinate being. Now attempting to pass beyond the bounds set by God for her restraint. There is a more emphatic, a more hopeless degradation for her. It is seen when she seeks to reverse the laws of her nature and upset the economy of the universe, pushing her way out of her own sphere into, a rivalry with men in their sphere and in their proper pursuits. On that must follow a degradation, greatly to be feared. When the claim for rights seems to be taking the form of a competition with man, on a field which God has reserved for man only, in a work not suited to the woman, and in professions already overstocked that must end. Not in enhancing the merit of woman in his eye but in making her offensive and detestable. There is a point beyond which patience will not hold out, and of this let the woman be sure, that if she go too far the end will arise. And man having long borne her manners and finding that she is becoming a social nuisance and a general tormentor, will finally lose all respect for her and thrust her away with loathing and disgust and bid her behave herself and go back to her old inferiority. In this series of lectures, Dr. Dix emphatically declared man's spiritual supremacy even in the household. The father is by God's law, priest over his household, to him should they look as a witness for that God who gave him his rank and title. 555. The sects agree in their teachings regarding woman, Rev. A. Sherman, at one time president of Bacon College, Kentucky, declaring that woman was first in transgression, that she beguiled man and was therefore put in bondage under his authority. Said. The widespreading contempt for this truth exhibited by the political religious fashion and infidelity of the age, is one of the most alarming symptoms of approaching anarchy and the overthrow of our liberties. The attempt which is being made in these United States to elevate the wife to a perfect equality with the husband, or to change in any respect the relation between them, established by God himself, is rank infidelity. No matter what specious disguise it may assume. In a sermon of his Lenten series, entitled, The Calling of a Christian Woman, and Her Training to Fulfill It, Dr. Dick said. We, priests, who whatever our personal shortcomings, have a commission from above and a message to man from God, and are the mouthpiece of that church to which his handmaidens belong, may be and ought to be able to help occasionally. By merely stating what the Bible and the church declare on certain great matters, on which many lower ones depend. What did Almighty God, the Creator, the wise Father of all, make woman for? What did He intend her to do? What did He not mean her to do or try to do? He answered these questions in a lecture entitled, A Mission for Woman, of the same series. Looking for a mission, for a work to do, this is the attitude of many women today. You hear of the education of women, of co-education of the sexes of emancipation of woman from bonds what bonds the Lord only knows. Here is a mission worthy of yourselves, it is of all works that could be rendered the fittest for a church woman, because she was at the beginning of all the trouble in the world. We believe the old story of the Bible reaffirmed by Christ and his apostles, that Adam was not deceived by the devil, but that the woman being deceived, was in the transgression. Now to her with whom the wrong began, we look for the beginning of the right. Remember that in the woman are the poles of the good and the evil in human nature. When she is good she is the best of all that exists, when bad, the worst. Another sermon of this Lenten series, expressed the views of the reverend gentleman upon the family relation, bearing of children in divorce. In which he expressed his hatred of modern development saying, I feel great solicitude about the subject of this evening's lecture. I had rather not touch it at all. You may think that its selection is an instance of that disrespect to which I have referred. Not so, oh, not so. I hold the old ideas. I abhor and detest the modern development. Before any woman who fears God, does her duty, and gives us in her life and acts the picture of a true and beautiful womanliness, I rise up and bless her and do her reverent homage. It is thus in no spirit of assumption that I shall say what I have to say tonight. It is rather in a tone of remonstrance, of wonder, of expostulation. Why do women err as they do? Why lower themselves to men's level? 
Why should the queens abdicate their thrones and go down to the ring and act unseemly parts and lay their honor in the dust? Let us think this evening of some things done by women which one would have said that no woman with a woman's heart in a woman's sense could, after due reflection, justify. Sins fall naturally into groups or classes, and if I speak this evening of only one class of sins it is because the time does not permit us to take a larger survey of the field. We shall limit ourselves, then, to these topics. The lack of serious views of life and the habit of turning the thoughts exclusively to enjoyment. The degradation of the idea of matrimony, as shown by entering into that estate for low and unworthy motives. The deliberate determination of some married women to defeat the objects for which marriage was instituted, to have no real home, to avoid first the pains and next the cares and duties of maternity. The habit, where a home exists, of neglecting it by spending most of the time away from it, running up and down in pursuit of excitement and turning their children over to the care of servants. The growing indifference to the chief of all social abominations, divorce, and the toleration of lax notions about it. These questions of most vital import to woman, to her material condition, intellectual development and place in the church, Rev. Dr. Dix and the great body of the church, deem themselves supremely competent to adjust without woman's voice upon them. Wherever she has shown her views upon the subject of education, industries, the family, the church, to be in opposition to those of theologians. She has at once been told to remain in her old position of inferiority, looking up to man as her divinely appointed master and spiritual head. Dr. Dix, in his lectures, but gave the views of priests of all denominations at the present day. Despite the advancing civilization of the age, and the fact that in so many avocations woman has shown her capacity for taking equal part with man, we find theology still unprogressive. A portion of the press, however, severely criticized these discourses. 556 The Lenten Pastoral, 1886, of Rev. A. Cleveland Cox, Bishop of Western New York, to the laity of his diocese, contained a middle-age reminder to women of the impurity of motherhood. In the demand made for church cleansing subsequent to her bringing an immortal being into life. Christian women, active as they often are, above all comparison with men, are yet sometimes negligent of their immediate duties as wives and mothers and fail to exert that healthful influence over the family, which God has made it the high privilege of woman to exercise in this sphere of her duty and her glory. The office for, the churching of women, testifies against those who neglect it, as forgetting the dignity of motherhood and that gratitude to God which every woman owes to the Christian religion, for enthroning her in the household. And making the example of the, blessed among women, her peculiar lesson and incentive to piety. Many portions of this advice is an open insult to woman, and could the divine but see it, is even from the Christian standard an imputation upon that being he professes to revere as the creator of the universe. A work was recently written by an English bishop, bearing upon the governmental effort for repeal of the law forbidding marriage with a deceased wife's sister or brother. This work was written for the express purpose of proving that, while it is eminently improper and sinful for a woman to marry her deceased husband's brother, it is eminently proper and right for a man to marry his deceased wife's sister and this upon the same principle that governed the disinheritance of woman under the Salic law. I.e., because by marriage a woman becomes merged into her husband's family. He specifically declares that the sister of the wife is in no sense the sister of the husband, therefore it is permissible for a man to marry his wife's sister successively. But he affirms that to the contrary, the widow cannot marry her deceased husband's brother, as by the act of her marriage she became a part of her husband's family a second marriage to such husband's brother thereby becoming incestuous. This is the law of England, both religious and civil. A striking evidence of the incongruity of this law is found in the fact that the illegitimacy of such brother is held to destroy the relationship, as by law of both church and state an illegitimate child is not held as related to its father. He is the son of nobody. A woman can marry two brothers in succession, one the child of marriage, the other a child of the same father born outside of the marriage relation. The son of nobody, a being unfathered in the eye of the law, is the brother of nobody. A striking instance of the effect of this law occurred in England within the past few years, 
when a lady successively married two brothers, the first a natural son of the Earl of Waldegrave, the second his legitimate son. The father, although not recognized as such in law, left the bulk of his property to his natural son, the title, over which he had no power of alienation, descending to the son born under authority of the church. The first husband, dying, the lady afterward married the legitimate son, thus becoming first, Mrs. Waldegrave, and afterwards, Lady Waldegrave, securing both fortune and title by her marriage with the non-recognized and low-recognized sons of the same father, and breaking neither the law of state or church in so doing. American clergymen of the Episcopal Church have expressed views in accordance with those of the English bishop. Rev. George Zabriskie Gray, D. D., Dean of the Episcopal Theological School of Cambridge, Massachusetts. Published a work in 1885 entitled, Husband and Wife, also suggested by the constantly debated English question of state, concerning the lawfulness of marriage with a deceased wife's sister. Dar. Gray coincides with many of his reverend brethren in the declaration that with the wife no liberty of divorce is allowable, but his reasons present somewhat the freshness of novelty. As previously stated, the non-relationship of husband and wife was at one time the general Christian belief. While like the English bishop, Rev. Mr. Gray admits the relationship of the wife to the husband to such extent that becoming fully absorbed by him his relatives become hers. Like the English bishop he farther declares that in consequence of this absorption, the wife loses her former family relationship, her mother and father, her sister or brother no longer bearing relationship to her. But have become to her as strangers. He said. The wife becomes a member of his family, while he does not become one of her own. The equilateral idea is a physiological 557 and psychological impossibility. The unity is in the man. The woman by marriage becomes a member of the man, therefore she cannot put him away, for a member cannot put away the head. The impurity of the wife imperils the family, renders pedigree, and all concern therein uncertain, and so she may be put away. But the husband's unchastity, while it may be as sinful, yet has no such effect. It does not render it doubtful who are rightful children of his stock, who are entitled to the name that he and his wife both bear, and therefore does not call for the severance of the marriage tie, that is, the dissolution of the family. That is, divorce so far as scripture goes seems to be a measure for the protection of the family and of the rightful inheritance of whatever is to be transmitted to the children, and so a remedy open only to man. There seems to be no way of preventing the abuse of divorce, if any principle is admitted that will extend it to woman. Under this form of reasoning, both Dr. Gray and the English bishop dispose with ease of the state obstacle to marriage with a deceased wife's sister. Inasmuch as by marriage the husband forms no ties of consanguinity with the wife's family, she having become a member of his family without his having become a member of hers. Marriage with his deceased wife's sister would be the same as marriage with an entire stranger, saying. As the husband enters into no connection with the wife's family, her sisters are no more his sisters than they had been before. Therefore he may marry one of them as freely as any one else, as far as any real principle involved in matrimony is concerned. The Christian Register, of Boston, commenting upon Dr. Gray's work, although itself a recognized organ of the Unitarian Church, read in a spirit more in accord with modern thought, carefully corrected the size of type in the word, wife, upon the title page and outside of the book. Thus, husband and wife, 558 also facetiously referring to the late Artemis Ward, who at time of the late civil war was ready to sacrifice all his wife's relations. 559 These two works of the English bishop and the American dean are consistent with the teaching of the Christian ages in reference to woman. Not held as belonging primarily to herself, but ever to some man, her very relationship to the mother who brought her into life destroyed by law, she once again through the church is presented to the world as a being without a birthright not even receiving for it Esau's mess of pottage, or a father's shorn blessing, after its loss. She is held up to view as without father, mother, or individual existence. Rev. Knox Little, a high church clergyman of England, traveled in the United States in the fall of 1880. During his stay in Philadelphia, 
he preached a sermon to women in the large church of St. Clement's. As reported in the Times of that city, its chief features were a representation of woman's inferior intellect, her duty of unqualified obedience to her husband, however evil his life. The sinfulness of divorce and the blessedness of a large family of children. He said, God made himself to be born of a woman to sanctify the virtue of endurance, loving submission is an attribute of woman, men are logical, but women lacking this quality, have an intricacy of thought. There are those who think woman can be taught logic. This is a mistake, they can never by any power of education arrive at the same mental status as that enjoyed by man, but they have a quickness of apprehension, which is usually called leaping at conclusions, that is astonishing. There, then, we have distinctive traits of a woman, namely, endurance, loving submission and quickness of apprehension. Wifehood is the crowning glory of a woman. In it she is bound for all time. To her husband she owes the duty of unqualified obedience. There is no crime which a man can commit which justifies his wife in leaving him or applying for that monstrous thing, divorce. It is her duty to subject herself to him always, and no crime that he can commit can justify her lack of obedience. If he be a bad or wicked man, she may gently remonstrate with him, but refuse him, never. Let divorce be anathema, curse it. Curse this accursed thing, divorce, curse it, curse it. Think of the blessedness of having children. I am the father of many and there have been those who have ventured to pity me, keep your pity for yourself, I have replied. They never cost me a single pang. In this matter let women exercise that endurance and loving submission, which with intricacy of thought are their only characteristics. Such a sermon as the above preached to women under the full blaze of nineteenth-century civilization, needs few comments. In it woman's inferiority and subordination are as openly asserted as at any time during the Dark Ages. According to Rev. Knox Little, woman possesses no responsibility, she is deprived of conscience, intelligent thought, self-respect, and is simply an appendage to man, a thing. As the clergy in the Middle Ages divided rights into those of persons and things, themselves being the persons, the laity things, so the Rev. Knox Little and his ilk of today, divide the world into persons and things, men being the persons, and women the things. Rev. Dr. T. DeWitt Talmadge, of Brooklyn, New York, joins his brethren in preaching of, the first, fair, frail woman. Her creation, her fall and her sorrow. Speaking of the trials of housekeepers, he said. Again, there is the trial of severe economy. 999 households out of the thousand are subject to it, some under more, and some under less stress of circumstances. Especially if a man smokes very expensive cigars and takes very costly dinners at the restaurants, he will be severe in demanding domestic economies. This is what kills thousands of women attempting to make five dollars do the work of seven. How the bills come in. The woman is the banker of the household, she is the president, and cashier, and teller, discount clerk, and there is a panic every four weeks. This thirty years war against high prices. This perpetual study of economics, this lifelong attempt to keep the outgoes less than the income exhausts millions of housekeepers. Oh, my sister, this is part of divine discipline. It should require but little thought upon woman's part to see how closely her disabilities are interwoven with present religious belief and teaching as to her inferiority and preordained subordination. If she needs aid to thought, the Cravens, the Knox Littles, the Talmages, will help her. The spirit of the priesthood, Protestant equally with Catholic, is that of the early and Middle Ages. The foundation being the same, the teaching is of similar character. From the sermons referred to, we can justly declare they express the opinions of the priesthood as a body, we meet no protest against them. Not a single church has denied these degrading theories, no clergyman has preached against the doctrines mentioned, blasphemous as they are against the primal rights of the soul. These sermons stand as representatives, not only of high church theology in regard to woman, but as expressing the belief of all churches in her creation and existence as an inferior and appendage to man. All her suffering, material or spiritual, her restrictions, her sorrows, 
her deprivation of the right of unrestricted conscience are depicted as parts of her divine discipline, which she must accept with endurance and loving submission. Even from the criminal, she is not to free herself or refuse him obedience. Scarcely a Protestant sect that has not within a few years, in some way, placed itself upon record as sustaining the doctrine of woman's subordination. The Pan-Presbyterian Council that assembled in Edinburgh a few years since refused to admit a woman even as a listener to its proceedings, although women constitute at least two-thirds of the membership of that church. A solitary woman who persisted in remaining to listen to the discussions of this body was removed by force, six stalwart Presbyterians, lending their ungentle aid to her ejection. The same Pan-Presbyterian body in session in Philadelphia, the summer of 1880, laughed to scorn the suggestion of a liberal member that the status of woman in that church should receive some consideration. Referring to the work of the Sisters of Charity, in the Catholic Church, and that of women among the Quakers. Although this question was twice introduced it was as often met with derisive laughter, and no action was taken upon it. But had this liberal member been wise enough to have brought before this body the fact that the Presbyterian Church is losing its political influence because of the great preponderance of its women members without the ballot, he would have received more consideration. As all churches seek influence in politics, we may rest assured that when the Church as a whole, or any sect thereof, shall be found sustaining the political rights of woman or her religious equality in the Church. It will be from the worldly wisdom of a desire to retain fleeting political power. The life or the death of the Church largely depends upon its political forethought. Differing political rights have ever been productive of diverse moral codes. What was considered right for the king and the nobility has ever been wrong for the peasant. The moral rights of the master and the slave were ever dissimilar, while under Christianity two codes of morals have ever been extant, the lax code for man, the strict for woman. This diversity is shown by the different position that society accords to an immoral man and an immoral woman, but nowhere is the recognition of differing codes of morals for man and woman as clearly shown as in the Church. As presented in Discourses of Clergymen. To them adultery in the husband is merely a pastime in which he can indulge without injury to his wife, who is powerless to put him away, nor has she been wronged. But to the contrary, under the same teaching, should the wife prove thus unfaithful she should immediately be cast out. Colored pastors unite with their white brethren in denying woman's moral, spiritual or personal equality with man. Rev. Alexander Crummel, 560 A colored clergyman of Washington, rector of St. Luke's, Episcopal, Church, in 1881, preached a sermon upon the biblical position of woman, which was published in tract form for circulation. He referred to her as having been created inferior to man, with no right, natural or acquired, by creation or revelation, to govern herself or hold opinions of her own. This sermon, Marriage and Divorce, laid down the following principles. Marriage is a divine institution. It came from God. It is not, therefore, the creation of legislative action. It is not merely a civil contract. It is not the invention of man. The estate of matrimony is a sacred one, originated by the will of God, and governed by His law. Marriage is indissoluble. Adultery on part of the wife is ground for divorce. Thus far we have considered the case with reference to the unfaithfulness of the wife, and have shown that when a woman violates the covenant of marriage by adultery, her husband has the right to divorce her. But now the question comes, is not this a reciprocal right? When husbands are unfaithful, have not wives the right to the divorce them? My reply is that no warrant for such divorce can be found in the Bible. Under both covenants, the right of divorce is given exclusively to husband. The right in all cases is guaranteed to the man only. And so far forth we have the word of God for its specific reservation to husbands. In no case is it even hinted that a woman has the right of divorce, if even her husband be guilty of unfaithfulness. There is a broad, general obligation laid upon woman in the marriage relation. The sum of the matter respecting the woman seems to be this, the woman is bound by the ties of wedlock during the whole period of her husband's life, and even under distressful circumstances has no right to break them, i.e., by divorce. 
The additional reasons presented by Rev. Mr. Crummell against woman's right of divorce, even for the infidelity of the husband, are, the hidden mystery of generation, the wondrous secret of propagated life committed to the trust of woman. In thus referring to those laws of nature whose conditions are not yet fully understood, Rev. Mr. Crummell presented the strongest reasons why the mother and not the father should be regarded as the true head of the family. This, hidden mystery of generation, this wondrous secret of propagated life, committed to the trust of woman, most forcibly demonstrates that she should be the one in whose power is placed the opportunity for escape from an adulterous husband. Thus enabling her to keep her body a holy temple for its divine human uses, over which as priestess she alone should possess control. The assertion of Rev. Alexander Crummell, that an adulterous husband cannot do the same wrong to the wife that the wife does to the husband under similar circumstances, is absolutely false. By reason of certain, physiological mysteries, to which he refers, but of which he also shows absolute ignorance. The wrong done woman by reason of her potential motherhood is infinitely greater to her than similar infidelity upon her part can possibly be to the husband. And not to her alone but to the children whom she may bring to life. His attempted justification of the husband's adultery upon the plea that, when a man begets bastard children, he does so beyond the boundary of the home. And so cannot, foist spurious children upon the household and kindred that the family is kept together, are most sophistical and fallacious methods of reasoning, entirely inimical to truth and purity. Of an absolutely selfish and libidinous character, they have been used by profligates in the church and in the state as pleas for a license that has no regard to the rights of woman, or the duties of fatherhood. And are not only essentially immoral in themselves, but are equally destructive of personal and social purity. The individual and not the family is the social unit, the rights of individuals are foremost. Immorality of man everywhere presents a more serious and destructive aspect than that of woman. Aside from the unmarried mother whom society does not recognize as longer a part of it, is the irreparable wrong done to those innocent human beings whom Rev. Mr. Crummell designates as spurious children. Whom the Catholics call sacrilegious, when the father is shown to be a priest, and upon whom society at large terms illegitimate. Closely connected with injury to the innocent child itself, thrust into being without provision for its future needs, is the detriment to society which thus finds itself compelled to assume the duties belonging to the bastard's father. Such children, for whom neither home nor fatherly care awaits, are allowed by him to grow up neglected street waifs, uneducated, untrained, uncared for, filling almshouses, reformatories, and prisons of the land, perhaps to die upon the gallows. The responsibility of such fathers is not a subject of church teaching, it is simply passed carelessly by, regardless of the unspeakable wrongs connected with it. If, as the Rev. Mr. Turnstall asserts, the Bible is not for woman, if his position is true, or if that of the Jews who claim that the Ten Commandments were given to man alone, is true, it is to man alone that adultery is forbidden. Luther asserted that the Ten Commandments applied to neither Gentiles nor Christians, but only to the Jews. It was to man alone that Christ spoke against adultery, saying, Whosoever looketh upon a woman to lust after her hath already committed adultery with her, in his heart. To man, Christ also said, owing to the hardness of their hearts, Moses permitted a man to put away his wife, but it was not so from the beginning. Man, and not woman, is commanded to leave father and mother. Man is to cleave unto his wife, hot woman unto her husband. It was the men of Corinth whom Paul addressed concerning lewdness, such fornication was never known among the heathen as that a man should take his father's wife. 561. One of the most remarkable facts connected with church teaching, is the lightness with which such positive declarations of Christ as to the relations of husband and wife are cast aside, or his teaching entirely reversed. In order that man may receive license for an immorality forbidden to woman. It must be noted that the chief reason given by the Church for assuming woman's greater guilt in committing adultery is not based upon the greater immorality of the act, per se, but the injury to property rights, succession, etc. It must also be noted that the great objection of the Church to divorce on part of woman lies in the fact that the wife thus escapes from a condition of bondage to one of comparative freedom. 
In securing a divorce she repudiates the husband's headship, she thus subverts his authority. By this act she places herself upon an equality of moral and property rights with man, and the church not admitting such equality between man and woman, is hostile to divorce upon her part. Every new security gained by woman for the protection of her civil rights in or out of the family, is a direct blow at the church theory of her inferiority and subordination. Her full freedom is to be looked for through her increased legal and political rights and not through the church. During the same year of the remarkable sermon by Rev. Alexander Crummell, 1881, Rev. S. W. Dilke read a paper before the Social Science Association at Saratoga, entitled, Lax Divorce Legislation. He showed the same disregard for the rights of the individual, when the individual was a wife, as his brother clergyman, saying, our lax divorce system treats the wrongs of the wife chiefly as those of a mere individual. He was assiduous in his regard for the protection of the womanly nature, recognizing sex, her sex, as, a profound fact in nature, but why the sex of woman should be a more, profound fact, than the sex of man, he did not show. That woman now claims a recognition of her individuality as a being possessed of personal rights, is the basis of present attack upon divorce by the church. Nor is the state more ready to admit her individual representation and personal rights of self-government. In March, 1887, Rev. E. B. Hurlbert preached a sermon in the First Baptist Church of San Francisco on, The Relation of Husband and Wife, afterward published. In which he said, the principal objection to the Episcopal marriage service raised by the self-willed woman of the period is that it requires her to obey her husband. But this objection is leveled equally against the requirement of the Word of God, and, furthermore, the additional promise to honor and love him can only be kept in the spirit of obedience. This obligation is founded upon the fact that he is her husband, and if she cannot reverence him for what he is in himself, still she must reverence him for the position which he holds. And, again, she must render this submissive reverence to her husband's headship as unto the Lord, as is fit in the Lord. She reverences him not simply as a man, but as her own husband, behind whom stands the Lord himself. It is the Lord who has made him husband, and the honor with which she regards him, though himself personally not deserving it, is in reality an honoring of the Lord. Many a Christian woman, actuated by this motive, has been most tenderly submissive, dutiful and patient, as towards the most unreasonable and despotic of husbands inspired by the remembrance that it was a service rendered unto Christ. Let the wife, then, reverence her husband for what he is in himself, for his loving and noble qualities. But if these qualities do not belong to him, then let her reverence him for the sake of his office simply because he is her husband and in either event let her reverence him, because in doing so she is honoring the Lord and Saviour. It is but a short time since the pastor of the Swedenborgian Church, Washington, D.C. As reported by one of his flock, expressed to that body his opinion that the church had better remain unrepresented rather than have women represented, and this, although nine-tenths of his congregation are women. It is, however, pleasing to state that the committee for that purpose elected an equal number of women with men, the efforts of the pastor against woman, securing but seven votes. The Unitarian and Universalist churches which ordain women to preach and administer the ordinances, still make these women pastors feel that the innovation is not a universally acceptable one. In a lengthy pastoral letter issued by the Episcopal Convention held in Chicago a few years since, it was asserted that the claim of the wife to an equal right with her husband to the control of her person, her property and her earnings was, disparaging the Christian law of the household. The Methodist Church still refuses to place woman upon an equality with man, either in the ministry or in lay representation, a few years since taking from them their previous license to preach, and this despite the fact that Mrs. Van Cott, a woman evangelist, did such severe work during a period of fourteen years, as to seriously injure her health. And so successful were her ministrations that she brought more converts to the church than a dozen of its most influential bishops during the same time. To such bitter lengths has opposition to woman's ordination been carried in that church that Rev. Mr. Buckley, editor of The Christian Advocate, 562 when debating the subject, 
declared that he would oppose the admission of the Mother of Our Lord into the ministry, the debate taking on most unseemly form. 563 Miss Oliver who had long been pastor of the Willoughby Street Church, in Brooklyn, appealed to the General Conference of the Methodist Episcopal Church, at its session in Cincinnati, May, 1880, for full installment and ordination. Saying, I am sorry to trouble our dear Mother Church with any perplexing question, but it presses me also, and the Church and myself must decide something. I am so thoroughly convinced that the Lord has laid commands upon me in this direction that it becomes with me really a question of my own soul's salvation. She then gave the reasons that induce her to believe that she is called to pastoral work, and concluded, I have made almost every conceivable sacrifice to do what I believe to be God's will. Brought up in a conservative circle in New York City, that held it a disgrace for a woman to work, surrounded with the comforts and advantages of ample means, and trained in the Episcopal Church, I gave up home, friends and support. Went counter to prejudices that had become second nature to me, worked several years to constant exhaustion, and suffered cold, hunger and loneliness. The things hardest for me to bear were laid upon me. For two months my own mother would not speak to me. When I entered the house she turned and walked away, and when I sat at the table she did not recognize me. I have passed through tortures to which the flames of martyrdom would be nothing, for they would end in a day, and through all this time and today I could turn off to positions of comparative ease and profit. I ask you, fathers and brethren, tell me what would you do in my place? Tell me what would you wish the church to do toward you, were you in my place? Please only apply the golden rule, and vote in conference accordingly. In answer to this powerful and noble appeal, and in reply to all women seeking the ministry of that church, the General Conference passed this resolution. Resolved, that women have already all the rights and privileges in the Methodist Church that are good for them. And that it is not expedient to make any change in the books of discipline that would open the doors for their ordination to the ministry. The General Conference, after so summarily deciding what was for the spiritual good of women, in thus refusing to recognize their equality of rights to the offices of that church, resolved itself as a whole into a political convention. Adjourning in a body to Chicago before its religious business was finished, in order that its presence might influence the National Republican Convention there assembled. To nominate General Grant for a third term to the Presidency of the United States. General Grant being in affiliation with the Methodist Church. The Congregational Church is placed upon record through laws, governing certain of its bodies, which state that. By the word church is meant the adult males duly admitted and retained by the First Evangelical Church of Cambridgeport. Present at any regular meeting of said church and voting by a majority. The New York Independent, of February 24, 1881, commenting upon this official declaration that only adult males are to be considered the church, says. The above is Article 14. Of the bylaws of the society connected with the aforesaid church. It is a matter of gratitude that the society, if it forbids females to vote in the church, yet allows them to pray and to help the society raise money. The Rev. W. V. Turnstall, in the Methodist Recorder, a few years since, gave his priestly views in regard to woman, and by implication those of the Methodist Church. He declared woman to be under the curse of subjection to man, a curse not removable until the resurrection. He said that under the Mosaic law woman had no voice in anything. That she could hold no office, yet did so in a few instances when God wished to especially humiliate the nation, that she was scheduled as a higher piece of property, that even the Bible was not addressed to her but to man alone. Woman finding her salvation even under the new covenant, not through man, his points were. First, that woman is under a curse which subjects her to man. Second, this curse has never been removed, nor will it be removed until the resurrection. Third, that woman under the Mosaic law, God's civil law, had no voice in anything. That she was not allowed her oath, that she was no part of the congregation of Israel, that her genealogy was not kept. That no notice was taken of her birth or death, except as these events were connected with some man of providence, that she was given no control of her children, that she could hold no office. Nor did she, except in a few instances, 
when to reproach and humiliate the nation, God suspended his own law, and made an instrument of women for the time being. That she offered no sacrifices, no redemption money was paid for her. That she, received no religious rites, that the mother's cleansing was forty days longer, and the gift was smaller for a female child than for a male. And that in the tenth commandment always in force she is scheduled as a higher species of property, that her identity was completely merged in that of her husband. Fourth, that for seeking to hold office Miriam was smitten with leprosy. And that under the new covenant she is only permitted to pray or prophesy with her head covered, which accounts for the fashion of wearing bonnets in public to this day. That she is expressly prohibited from rule in the church or usurpation of authority over the man. Fifth, that to vote is to rule, voting carrying with it all the collaterals of making, expounding, and executing law. That God has withheld from woman the right to rule either in the church, the state, or the family, that he did this because of her having brought sin and death into the world, and all our woe. Sixth, that the Bible is addressed to man and not to woman, that man comes to God through Jesus, and woman comes to Jesus through man. That every privilege the wife enjoys she but receives through the husband, for God has declared that woman shall not rule man, but be subject unto him. A more explicit statement of the opinion of the church regarding woman is seldom found. Later action of the Methodist body proves its agreement with Rev. Mr. Turnstall. The General Conference of that church convened May 1, 1888, in the Metropolitan Opera House, New York, numbering delegates from every part of the United States as well as many from foreign lands. Among these delegates were sixteen women. The question of their admission came up the first day. The Senior Bishop, Rev. Thomas Bowman, in his opening remarks, declared that body to stand in the presence of new conditions, in that they found names upon the role of a class of persons whose eligibility had never been determined by the high tribunal of the church. A committee was appointed to report upon their admission. Bishop Merrill, occupying the chair upon the second day, said that, for the first time in the history of a conference, women had been sent as delegates, but the bishops did not think the women were eligible. The report of the committee was submitted, which declared that after a serious discussion they had become convinced that, while the rule was passed relating to the admission of lay delegates to the General Conference, the Church contemplated admission only to men as lay delegates, and that under the Constitution and laws, women were not eligible. The committee agreed that the protest against women should be sustained, and the conferences from which they were sent be notified that their seats were vacant. A long discussion ensued. Rev. John Wiley, president of the Drew Theological Seminary of the New York Conference, spoke against woman's admission, saying, that if the laws of the church were properly interpreted they would prove that women are not eligible and then, besides, no one wanted them in the general conference. Rev. J. R. Day, the New York Conference, argued against the admission of women, saying, when the law was passed for the admission of lay delegates it was never intended that women should be delegates to the General Conference. It is proposed today to make one of the most stupendous pieces of legislation that has been known to Christendom. I am not opposed to woman doing the work that she is capable of doing but I do not think that she should intrude upon the General Conference. Woman has not the necessary experience, this is a tremendous question. Rev. Jacob Rothweiler of the Central German Conference, asserted that the opponents of the report are trying to override the constitution of the Church and are making an effort to strike at the conscientiousness of go percent of the Christian Church which has existed for the last 1,800 years. The history of Christianity shows that women were never intended to vote. The conference was seriously divided upon this question. Although eventually lost, yet many clergymen permeated with the spirit of advancing civilization, voted in its favor, among them Rev. Dr. Hammond, of Syracuse, New York, a delegate for the Episcopacy, while arrayed in bitter opposition was Rev. Mr. Buckley, editor of The Christian Advocate, also a candidate for the bishopric, and the man that when the question of the ordination of Miss Oliver came up a few years since, declared he would oppose the admission of the Mother of the Lord to the ministry. His remark recalls that of Tetzel, 
the great Catholic dealer in indulgences, given in another part of this work, and illustrates to what extent of blasphemy the opponents of women's equality proceed. It was not until the seventh day of the conference that the question of woman's admission was decided in the negative. And the great Methodist Episcopal Church put itself upon record as opposed to the recognition of more than one half of its members. The women delegates were not even allowed seats upon the floor during the debate. Mrs. Nine, president of the Women's Foreign Missionary Society, arose to vote, but was not counted, although the Women's Foreign Missionary Societies are making converts where men cannot reach in the Zananas. The action of the conference was foreshadowed by that of Baltimore a few weeks previously. When it was decided that women missionaries should not be permitted to administer communion in the Zananas as it would open the door for their ordination to the ministry and this despite the fact that women alone are admitted to the Zananas. At the Methodist Minister's bi-monthly meeting, Syracuse, N. Y., near time of the General Conference, Rev. Thomas Tinsey, of Clyde, read a paper entitled, is it advisable to make women of the church eligible to all the ecclesiastical councils and the ministerial order of the church, quoting Paul in opposition to giving her a voice. Saying. What can our modern advocates of licensing and ordaining women and electing them to annual conferences, do with the command to the Corinthians, let your women keep silence in the church? Or to Timothy, let the women learn in silence and all subjection, Paul certainly meant something by such teaching. The position taken by the fathers of Methodism appears to me to be the only tenable one. Viz, that the prohibition applies to the legislation or official business of the Church precisely the kind of work contemplated in the effort to make them eligible to the General Conference, and to Methodist orders. Concerning these things, let them learn of their husbands at home. Rev. Mr. Tinsey farther gave his opinion as to the comparative uselessness of woman. He was able to conceive of no good reason for her creation, aside from that of burden-bearer in the process of reproduction, saying. Woman is that part or side of humanity upon which the great labor, care and burden of reproduction is placed. We can conceive of no good reason for making women aside from this. Man is certainly better suited to all other work. After discussion, the ministers present generally agreed that, because of motherhood, woman should be debarred from such official recognition. The final ground of women's exclusion as delegates to the General Conference, is most noticeable inasmuch as appeal was ultimately made to the state. Upon the seventh day's session it was resolved to suspend the rules and continue the debate on the admission of women as lay delegates. So anxious were men to speak that forty-one delegates at once sprung to their feet and claimed the floor. Judge Taylor, a lay delegate from this T. Lewis Conference, walking down the aisle with a number of law books under his arm, proceeded to argue the question on constitutional grounds, saying. It would do much harm to admit women at the present time. There are bishops to be elected and other important matters to be voted on, and if women are, admitted and allowed to vote, and it should subsequently be decided that women should not be entitled to seats. The acts of the present General Conference would be illegal and unconstitutional. While claiming, personally, to favor women's admission, he quoted law to sustain their rejection, and wished the question to be submitted to a vote of the Church. The vote of the Church, as shown by the adoption of Rev. F. B. Neely's amendment, signifying the ministers present at annual conferences. 564 The vote upon this amendment, which excluded women from seats in the General Conference, submitting their eligibility to the decision of ministers of the annual conferences, was adopted 237 to 198. It thus requires three-fourths vote of the members present and voting at the annual conferences, this vote to be ratified by a two-thirds vote of the General Conference in order to woman's acceptance as lay delegate to such General Conference 565. Aside from the fact of an appeal to the civil law for the exclusion of woman, thus showing the close union of church and state, one other important point must be noticed. In the declaration that the church should be consulted in regard to such an important matter, that body was defined as the ministers of the annual conference, laymen not here ranking as part of the church. The lay delegates, unnarrowed by theological studies were, as a body, favorable to woman's admission. Nor did they refrain from criticizing the clergy, 
declaring that the episcopacy did not interpret the law of the church, this power resting in the general conference. But one more favoring vote would have tied the question. General Samuel H. Hearst, Dairy and Food Commissioner of Ohio, the first layman to gain the floor, defended the right of women to admission. He alluded to the opponents of the women as old fogies. He criticized the bishop's address. The episcopacy does not interpret the law of the church, but the general conference does. Woman does not come here as a strong-minded person demanding admittance, but she comes as representative of the lay conference. The word layman was interpreted to mean all members of the church not represented in the ministry. That is the law, and if women are laymen, they are entitled to admission. The Southern Baptist Association, meeting in New Orleans in July of the same year, refused to admit women by a vote of 42 to 40. The church as of old, is still strenuous in its efforts to influence legislation. An amendment to the National Constitution is pressed by the National Reform Association, recognizing the sectarian idea of God, another placing marriage and divorce under control of the general government by uniform laws. While priestly views upon the political freedom of woman are thrust into the very faces of our lawmakers. 566 The following portions of a sermon preached at the Cathedral of the Holy Cross, Boston, February 21, 1886, by the Rev. Father J. P. Bodfish, were printed and distributed among the members of the Massachusetts legislature that spring by the opponents of woman suffrage. 567. Not that I would have woman step out of her sphere. The man is the natural protector, the father, the lawgiver, of his, family, nor would I counsel wives to usurp the places of their husbands at the polls. I believe this to be one of the errors of modern times, to try to unsex woman, and take her from the high place she occupies and drag her into the arena of public life. What has she to do there? We might as well try to drag down the angels to take part in the menial affairs of this world as to take woman from the high place she occupies in the family, where it is her privilege and duty to guide, to counsel and to instruct to lead that family in the way of righteousness. It is but offering her a degradation, Almighty God never intended it. The charm, the influence of woman, is in that purity that comes from living in a sphere apart from us. God forbid that we should ever see the day that a man, a husband or a father, is to find his will opposed and thwarted at the poles by his daughter or his wife. Then farewell to that reverence which belongs to the character of woman. She puts herself on an equal footing with man when she steps down from that place where every one regards her with reverence, and becomes unsexed by striving to make laws which she cannot enforce. And taking upon herself duties for which she is altogether unfitted. Decrees of various characters presenting woman as a being of different natural and spiritual rights from man, are constantly formulated by the churches. The Plenary Council of Baltimore, 1884, busied itself in the enactment of canons directly bearing upon marriage and divorce. Reaffirming the sacramental character of marriage and declaring that marriages under civil rights should be resented by the whole Catholic world this council was preceded by an encyclical from the Pope. Laying out its plans by work yet leaving it within the power of the diocesan bishops to promulgate its canons according to their own wisdom. Consequently, not until three years later were those upon marriage published on the Pacific coast, at which time the Archbishop of San Francisco, the bishops of Monterey, Los Angeles and Grass Valley, addressed a pastoral letter to the Catholics of those regions, condemning civil marriage as a sin and sacrilege, illegal, and a horrible concubinage. It was farther stated that marriage unblessed by a priest, subjected the parties to excommunication. At the still later Catholic Congress, in honor of the hundredth anniversary of the Catholic hierarchy in America, divorces were affirmed to be the plague of civilization, a discredit to the government, a degradation of the female sex, and a standing menace to the sanctity of the marriage bond. In noting these canons of the Plenary Council, and the resolutions of the Catholic Congress, it should be borne in mind that the chief secret of the long-continued power of the Catholic Church has been its hold upon marriage and the subordination of woman in this relation. To these celibate priests, nothing connected with woman is sacred. Celibacy and the sacramental nature of marriage are each of them based upon the theory of woman's created inferiority and original sin. 
priestly power over marriage, and the confessional, through which means it is able to wrest all family and state secrets to its own use, are powers that will not be peaceably relinquished. Their destruction will come through the growing intelligence of people, and the responsibility of political self-government. These will ensure confidence in the validity of civil marriage and a belief in the personal rights of individuals. To woman, the education of political responsibility is most essential in order to free her from church bonds, and is therefore most energetically opposed by the church. In 1890, a number of Catholic ladies of Paris formed a union for the emancipation of women from different kinds of social thraldom. 568 Their first attack was upon the priesthood, whom they declared the mortal adversary of woman's advancement, affirming that every woman who abets the abbés is an enemy of her sex. This open rebellion of Catholic ladies against the power of the hierarchy, is a significant sign of woman's advancing freedom. All canons, decrees, resolutions and laws of the Church, especially bearing upon the destinies of woman are promulgated without the bearing of her voice either in confirmation or rejection. She is simply legislated for as a slave. Two of the later triennial conclaves of the Episcopal Church of the United States energetically debated the subject of divorce, not, however, arriving at sufficient unanimity of opinion for the enactment of a canon. When Mazzini, the Italian patriot, was in this country, 1852, he declared the destruction of the priesthood to be our only surety for continued freedom, saying, They will be found as in Italy, the foes of mankind. And if the United States expects to retain even its political liberties, it must get rid of the priesthood as Italy intends to do. 569. Francis Wright, that clear-seeing, liberty-loving, Scotch-free-thought woman, noted the dangerous purpose and character of the Christian party in politics, even as early as 1829. And the present effort of this body, now organized as the National Reform Association, with its adjunct, the American Sabbath Union, officered by priests and influential members of the Women's Christian Temperance Union, and kindred bodies, is a perpetual menace to the civil and religious liberties of the United States. Its effort for an amendment to the federal constitution which shall recognize the United States as a Christian nation, is a determined endeavor toward the union of church and state. And its success in such attempt will be the immediate destruction of both civil and religious liberty. That such a party now openly exists, its intentions no secret, is evidence that the warnings of Italian patriot and the Scotch free thinker were not without assured foundation. As a body, the Church opposes education for women, and all the liberalizing tendencies of the last thirty-five or forty years, which have opened new and varied industries to women and secured to wives some relief from their general serf condition. Bishop Littlejohn, of the Episcopal Church, at the Triennial Conclave of Bishops, 1883, preached as his triennial charge upon the Church and the family, presenting the general Church idea as to woman's inferiority in subordination. He made authoritative use of the words, sanctities of home, a phrase invented by the clergy as a method of holding woman in bondage. Directed the church to, strictly impose her doctrines as to marriage and divorce, clash as they may with the spirit of the times and the laws of the state, thus emulating the Catholic doctrines of the supremacy of the church. He declared that in any respect to change the relation established by God himself between husband and wife, was. Rank infidelity no matter what specious, disguise such change might assume, explicitly declaring the authority of the Church over marriage, as against the authority of the state. Protesting against omission of the word, obey, from the marriage service, and the control of the wife over her own earnings and expenditures. Saying. If it be outside the province of the states to treat marriage as more than a contract between a man and a woman, the Church must make it understood, as it is not, that it is inside her province to treat it as a thing instituted of God. Practically, we have reached a point where the wife may cease to have property interests in common with her husband, may control absolutely her own means of living, and determine for herself the scale of expenditures that will suit her tastes or her caprices. The man is no longer the head of the household, the husband. It has been made an open question whether the man or his wife will fulfill that function, and the community of interests, with the recognized authority of the husband to rule the wife, and the recognized duty of the wife to obey that authority. 
is no longer deemed expedient or necessary. This rebellion against the old view of marriage is so strong that in many cases the word obey is omitted from the marriage service. Even among Christianized Indians we find different laws governing man and woman. In 1886, the governor of Maine paid a visit to the governor of the Passamaquoddy Indians, at a time when a large council was in progress upon the St. Croix Reservation. This council first assembled at the chapel, where the revised statutes the whole basis of government of the Passamaquoddies are pasted. These statutes having been approved by Bishop Healy, of Portland, are also looked upon as canons of the Church. 570. The statutes principally affecting women, are. Third, no woman who is separated from her husband shall be admitted to the sacrament, or to any place in the church except the porch in summer and the back seat in winter. Unless by the consent of the bishop. Fourth, any woman who admits men into her house by night shall be treated as a criminal and delivered. To the courts. Fifth, any woman who is disobedient to her husband, any common scold or drunkard, shall not be permitted to enter the church, except by permission of the priest. It will be noted that these statutes forbid the sacrament to the woman who is separated from her husband, not even permitting her an accustomed seat in church. She must remain in the porch during the summer and in a back seat during the winter, except the bishop otherwise permits. Also the woman not rendering obedience to her husband, is denied permission to enter the church except under priestly permit the Christian theory of woman's inferiority and subordination to man is as fully endorsed by these statutes as in the medieval priestly instruction to husbands. 571. No profession as constantly appeals to the lower nature as the priestly, the emotions rather than reason, are constantly invoked. Ambition, love of power, hope of reward, fear of punishment, are the incentives presented and in no instance are such incentives more fully made use of than for purposes of sustaining the supremacy of man over woman. The teaching of the church cannot fail to impress woman with the feeling that if she expects education, or even opportunity of full entrance into business, she must not heed the admonitions of the priesthood, when, as by Dr. Dix, she is contemptuously forbidden to enter the professions on the ground that God designed these offices alone for man. When women sought university honors at Oxford, a few years since, many, incredibly foolish, letters, said, London Truth, were written by its opponents, who were chiefly clergymen. Canon Lydon's influence was against the statute. The Dean of Norwich referred to it as, an attempt to defeat divine providence and holy scripture. Dr. Gouldborn thought it would, unsex woman, 572. There is no sin, said Buddha, but ignorance, yet according to Rector Dix, Rev. S. W. Turnstall, Dr. Craven and the priesthood of the present day, in common with the earlier church, woman's normal condition is that of ignorance, and education is the prerogative of man alone. And yet the dangers of ignorance have by no means been fathomed, although the latest investigations show the close relation between knowledge and life. That as intelligence is diffused, there is a corresponding increase of longevity, is proven. The most uneducated communities showing the greatest proportion of deaths. Ignorance and the death rate are parts of the same question, education and length of life are proportionately synonymous. Statistics gathered in England, Wales and Ireland a few years since showed the percentage of infantile deaths to be much greater in those portions where the mother could not read and write. Than where the mother had sufficient education to read a newspaper and write her own name. In districts where there was no other appreciable difference except that of education, the mortality was the largest in the most ignorant districts. In deprecating education for women, no organized body in the world has so clearly proven its own tyrannous ignorance as has the priesthood, and no body has shown itself so fully the enemy of mankind. Church teaching and centuries of repression acting through the laws of heredity have lessened woman's physical size, depressed her mental action, subjugated her spirit, and crushed her belief in her right to herself and the proper training of her own children. The Church, in its opposition to woman's education through the ages, has literally killed off the inhabitants of the world with much greater rapidity than war, pestilence, or famine. 
more than one half the children born into the world have soon died because of the tyranny and ignorance of the priesthood. 573 The potential physical energy of mankind thus destroyed can in a measure be estimated, but no one can fathom the infinitely greater loss of mental and moral force brought about through condemnation of knowledge to woman. Only by induction can it even be surmised. Lecky points out the loss to the world because so many of its purest characters donned the garb of monk or nun. That injury was immediately perceptible, but in the denial of education and freedom to woman more than 90% of the moral and physical energy of the world has literally been suffocated. And owing to ignorance and lack of independent thought this loss is as yet scarcely recognized. So dense the pall of ignorance still overshadowing the world that even woman herself does not yet conjecture the injury that has been done her, or of what she and her children have been deprived. Nor has the world yet roused to a full consciousness of the mischief to mankind that has been perpetrated through the falsehood and ignorant presumption of those claiming control over its dearest rights and interests. Resistance to the wrong thus done the world has been less possible because perpetrated in the name of God and religion. It has caused tens of thousands of women to doubt their equality of right with man in education, to disbelieve they possess the same authority to interpret the Bible or present its doctrines as man. Neither, having been deprived of education, do they believe themselves to be man's political equal, or that they possess equal rights with him in the household. This degradation of woman's moral nature is the most direful result of the teaching of the Church in regard to her. A loss of faith in one's own self, Disbelief in one's own right to the fullest cultivation of one's own powers, proceeds from a debasement of the moral sentiments. Self-reliance, self-respect, self-confidence, are acquired through that cultivation of the intellectual faculties which has been denied to woman. Rev. Dr. Charles Little, of the Syracuse University, says, in the report of a sermon of a distinguished theologian which appeared not long ago, this striking passage occurred if I were to choose between Christianity as a life and Christianity as a dogma. I would choose Christianity as a dogma. Judging from its treatment of woman and the many recent trials for heresy, dogma rather than life is the general spirit of the churches everywhere. It is dogma that has wrecked true religion, it is dogma that has crushed humanity. It is dogma that has created two codes of morals, that has inculcated the doctrine of original sin, that has degraded womanhood, that has represented divinity as possessing every evil attribute. From all these incontrovertible facts in church and state, we see that both religion and government are essentially masculine in their present forms and development. All the evils that have resulted from dignifying one sex and degrading the other may be traced to one central error, a belief in a trinity of masculine gods, in one from which the feminine element is wholly eliminated. And yet in the scriptural account of the simultaneous creation of man and woman, the text plainly recognizes the feminine as well as the masculine element in the Godhead, and declares the equality of the sexes in goodness, wisdom and power. Genesis I, 26-27 And God said, Let us make man in our own image, after our likeness, and so God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him, male and female created he them, and gave them dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air, and over every living thing that moveth upon the earth. In nothing has the ignorance and weakness of the church been more fully shown than in its controversies in regard to the creation. From time of the fathers, to the present hour, despite its assertion and its dogmas, the church has ever been engaged in discussions upon the Garden of Eden, the serpent, woman, man, and God as connected in one inseparable relation. Amid all the evils attributed to woman, her loss of paradise, introduction of sin into the world and the consequent degradation of mankind, yet Eve, and through her, all women have found occasional defenders. A book printed in Amsterdam, 1700, in a series of eleven reasons, threw the greater culpability upon Adam, saying. First, the serpent tempted her before she thought of the tree of knowledge of good and evil, and suffered herself to be persuaded that not well understood his meaning. Second, that believing that God had not given such prohibition she eat the fruit. Third, sinning through ignorance she committed a less heinous crime than Adam. Fourth, that Eve did not necessarily mean the penalty of eternal death, 
for God's decree only imported that man should die if he sinned against his conscience. Fifth, that God might have inflicted death on Eve without injustice, yet he resolved, so great is his mercy toward his works, to let her live, in, that, she had not sinned maliciously. Sixth, that being exempted from the punishment contained in God's decree, she might retain all the prerogatives of her sex except those that were not incidental with the infirmities to which God condemned her. Seventh, that she retained in particulars the prerogative of bringing forth children who had a right to eternal happiness on condition of obeying the new Adam. Eighth, that as mankind was to proceed from Adam and Eve, Adam was preserved alive only because his preservation was necessary for the procreation of children. Ninth, that it was by accident therefore, that the sentence of death was not executed on him, but that otherwise he was more, justly, punished than his wife. Tenth, that she was not driven out from paradise as he was, but was only obliged to leave it to find out Adam in the earth, and that it was with full privilege of returning thither again. Eleventh, that the children of Adam and Eve were subject to eternal damnation, not as proceeding from Eve, but as proceeding from Adam. In 1580, but three hundred years since, an inquiry set on foot as to the language of paradise, resulted in the statement that God spoke Danish, Adam, Swedish, and the serpent, French. Eve doubtless was conceded to have spoken all three languages, as she conversed with God, with Adam, and with the serpent, Hieronymus, a father of the church, credited Eve with possessing a much finer constitution than Adam. And in that respect as superior to him. 574. Thus, during the ages, the church through its fathers, and its priests has devoted itself to a discussion of the most trivial questions concerning woman, as well as to the formation of most oppressive canons against her, and although as shown. She has found an occasional defender, and even claimants for her superiority upon certain points, yet such discussions have had no effect upon the general view in which the church has presented her, as one accursed of God and man. X. Past, Present, Future. The most important struggle in the history of the Church is that of woman for liberty of thought and the right to give that thought to the world. As a spiritual force the Church appealed to barbaric conception when it declared woman to have been made for man, first in sin and commanded to be under obedience. Holding as its chief tenet a belief in the inherent wickedness of woman, the originator of sin, as it sequenced the sacrifice of a God becoming necessary. The Church has treated her as alone under a curse for whose enforcement it declared itself the divine instrument. Woman's degradation under it dating back to its earliest history, while the 19th century still shows religious despotism to have its stronghold in the theory of woman's inferiority to man. The Church has ever invoked the Old Covenant as authority, while it also asserts this covenant was done away with at the advent of the new dispensation. Paul whose character as persecutor was not changed when he veered from Judaism to Christianity, gave to the Church a lever long enough to reach down through eighteen centuries in opposition to woman's equality with man. Through this lengthy period, his teaching has united the Christian world in opposition to her right of private judgment and personal freedom. Each great division of Christianity alike proclaims the supreme sinfulness of woman in working for the elevation of her sex. In this work she has been left outside of religious sympathy, outside of political protection. Yet in the interest of justice she claims the right to tear down the barriers of advancing civilization and to rend asunder all beliefs that men hold most sacred. Freedom for woman underlies all the great questions of the age. She must no longer be the scapegoat of humanity upon whose devoted head the sins of all people are made to rest. Woman's increasing freedom within the last hundred years is not due to the church, but to the printing press, to education, to free thought and other forms of advancing civilization. The fashions of the Christian world have changed but not its innermost belief. The power of the pulpit, built up by a claim of divine authority, with the priest as an immediate representative of God, has been reacting upon the priesthood itself. And now while vainly struggling for light this order finds itself bound by chains of its own creating. Today the priesthood is hampered by creeds and dogmas centuries old, yet so fully outside of practical life that the Church has become the great materialistic force of the century. Its ideas of a God, 
its teachings of a future life all falling within the realm of the physical senses, the incorporeal and spiritual are lost in the grossest forms of matter. 575 Although a body professing to inculcate pure spiritual truths, the Church teaches the grossest form of materialism. It asserts principles contradictory to natural laws, it presents chaos as the normal condition of the infinite. It bids people live under faith outside of evidence, and in thus doing is guilty of immeasurable evils to mankind. A bark without compass, it steers upon a sea of night no star illumining the darkness. The control and guidance by humanity of the psychic part of being, generally spoken of as supernatural, although the truest to nature, has become nearly lost through the materialization of spiritual truth by the Church, the worst form of idolatry. Christianity was a stern reality to the men of the early and middle ages, who believing themselves to have been created nearer to God than woman also believed themselves to have lost earthly immortality through her. Permeated with this idea, it is not strange that men through many hundred years taught that woman was especially under control of the evil one. The devil was an objective form to the clergy and people alike. Nor under such belief, is it strange that priests should warn their flocks from the pulpit against the wiles of woman, thus degrading her self-respect and teaching men to hold her in that contempt whose influence is felt today. The result of this teaching has been deplorable to humanity, men equally with women having sunk under this degradation of one half of the race. The most stupendous system of organized robbery known has been that of the church towards woman, a robbery that has not only taken her self-respect but all rights of person, the fruits of her own industry, her opportunities of education. The exercise of her own judgment, her own conscience, her own will. The unfortunate peculiarity of the history of man, according to Buckle, is that although its separate parts have been examined with considerable ability, Hardly anyone has attempted to outline them into a whole and ascertain the way they are connected with each other. While this statement is virtually true as regards the general history of mankind, it is most particularly so in reference to the position of woman in its bearings upon race development. A thorough investigation of her connection with our present form of civilization, or even with that of the past, as compared with each other, or as influencing the whole, has never yet been authoritatively undertaken. This failure has not been so largely due to willful neglect as to incapacity upon the part of man to judge truly of this relation. Woman herself must judge of woman. The most remote feminine personality is not less incomprehensible to man than the woman of today, he now as little understands the finer qualities of her soul or her high intuitive reasoning faculties as in the past. Reason is divided into two parts, theoretical and practical, the former appertains to man, the latter, composed of those intuitive faculties which do not need a long process of ratiocination for their work, in here in woman. Although the course of history has given many glimpses of her superiority, and the past few decades have shown in every land a new awakening of woman to a recognition of her own powers, man as man is still as obtuse as of yore. He is yet under the darkness of the patriarchate, failing to recognize woman as a component part of humanity, whose power of development and influence upon civilization are at least the equal of his own. He yet fails to see in her a factor of life whose influence for good or for evil has ever been in direct ratio with her freedom. He does not yet discern her equal right with himself to impress her own opinions upon the world. He still interprets governments and religions as requiring from her an unquestioning obedience to laws she has no share in making, and that place her as an inferior in every relation of life. Ralph Waldo Emerson with keen insight into the fallibility of lawmakers, declared that, good men must not obey the laws too well. Woman is showing her innate wisdom in daring to question the infallibility of man, his laws, and his interpretation of her place in creation. She is not obeying, too well, and yet man fails to analyze her motives in this defection. The church and the state have long done man's thinking for him, the ideas of the few, whose aim is power, have been impressed upon the many, individualism is still characterized as the essence of evil, self-thought, self-control as heretical. The state condemns both as a crime against itself, the church as a sin against heaven. Both church and state claiming to be of divine origin have assumed divine right to the control of man, also asserting the divine right of man over woman. 
while church and state have thought for man, man has assumed the right to think for woman. 576. As man under fear of eternal damnation surrendered to the irresponsible power of church and state, so woman yielded to that power which closed every external avenue of knowledge to her under pretext of her sinfulness. One tenth of the human race, within the period covered by modern civilization, has compelled the other nine tenths to think their thoughts and live lives according to their commands. This has been the chief effort of governments and religion. The most formidable general evil under which woman has suffered during the Christian ages has been that of protection, a non-recognition, of her ability to care for herself, rendering watchful guardianship over her a recognized part of man's law. Not alone to prevent her sinking into depths of vice but to also prevent her entire subversion of government and religion. Buckle and other writers have recognized the protective spirit as the greatest enemy to civilization, its influence causing the few to establish themselves as guardians of the many in all affairs of life. The American Revolution in proclaiming the rights of humanity struck a blow at the protective system. This system has ever based itself upon a declaration of the supreme rights of a god, and certain rights as pertaining to certain classes of men by virtue of authority from that god. The defense of such authority has ever been the chief business of church and state, and thus religions and governments have neither found time nor inclination to uphold the rights of humanity. Under the Christian system, woman as the most rebellious against God in having eaten a forbidden fruit, has found herself condemned through the centuries to untold oppression in order that the rights of God might be maintained. Yet while constantly teaching that woman brought sin into the world, the church ever forgets its own corollary, that if she brought sin she also brought a God into the world, thus throwing ineffable splendor over mankind. The whole theory regarding woman, under Christianity, has been based upon the conception that she had no right to live for herself alone. Her duty to others has continuously been placed before her and her training has ever been that of self-sacrifice. Taught from the pulpit and legislative halls that she was created for another, that her position must always be secondary even to her children, her right to life, has been admitted only in so far as its reacting effect upon another could be predicated. That she was first created for herself, as an independent being to whom all the opportunities of the world should be open because of herself, has not entered the thought of the church, has not yet become one of the conceptions of law, is not yet the foundation of the family. But woman is learning for herself that not self-sacrifice, but self-development, is her first duty in life, and this, not primarily for the sake of others but that she may become fully herself. A perfectly rounded being from every point of view, her duty to others being a secondary consideration arising from those relations in life where she finds herself placed at birth, or those which later she voluntarily assumes. But these duties are not different in point of obligation, no more imperative upon her, than are similar duties upon man. The political doctrine of the sovereignty of the individual, although but partially recognized even in the United States, has been most efficacious in destroying that protective spirit which has so greatly interfered with the progress of humanity. This spirit yet retains its greatest influence in the family, where it places a boundary between husband and wife. Of all circumstances biasing the judgment and restricting the sympathies, none have shown themselves more powerful than physical differences, whether of race, color or sex. When those differences are not alone believed to be a mark of inferiority, but to have been especially created for the pleasure and peculiar service of another, the elements of irresponsible tyranny upon one side, and irremediable slavery upon the other, are already organized. If in addition, that inferior is regarded as under an especial curse for extraordinary sin, as the Church has ever inculcated in reference to women. And when as in the case of woman and man an entire separation of interests, hopes, feelings and passions is impossible, we have reached the extreme of injustice and misery under the protective system. Consequently no other form of protection has possessed so many elements of absolute injustice as that of man over woman. Swedenborg taught, and experience declares, that morality cannot exist except under conditions of freedom. Hence we find much that has been called morality is the effect of dependence and lessened self-respect, and has really been immorality and degradation. 
While in every age, the virtues of self-sacrifice have been pointed to as evidence of the highest morality, we find those women in whom it has been most apparent, have been those doing least justice where justice first belongs to themselves. Justice as the foundation of the highest law, is a primal requirement of the individual to the self. It is nonetheless a serious impeachment of the religious moral idea, that the doctrine of protection and the duty of woman's self-sacrifice, were taught under the theory of divine authority. No faith was more profound, none could be more logical if resting on a true foundation, than the church theory regarding woman. Life assumed a sterner reality to men who believed themselves in point of purity and priority nearer their creator than woman. Thereafter, she was to be protected from herself, the church and man cheerfully assuming this duty. Under the protective spirit it is not so very long since men sold themselves and their families to some other man in power, either lay or religious, under promise of protection, binding themselves to obey the mandates of such lord evermore. The church protected and directed the thought of the world. To think for oneself is not even now the tendency of mankind, the few who dare, do so at great peril. It will require another hundred years of personal and political freedom for men to appreciate what liberty really is for them to possess confidence in their own judgment upon religious questions for the man of humble station to fully believe in himself and in his own opinions when opposed to the authority of church or state. Women of the present century who struggle for equal opportunity of education with men, for a chance to enter the liberal professions, for a fair share of the world of work, for equal pay in that work. For all demands of equality which make the present a noted age in the world's history, have met their greatest opposition from this protective spirit. No less than during the darkest period of its history does the Church still maintain the theory that Education 577 and public life are not fitting for woman indelicate for herself and injurious to the community. During the Christian ages, the Church has not alone shown cruelty and contempt for woman, but has exhibited an impious and insolent disregard of her most common rights of humanity. It has robbed her of responsibility, putting man in place of God. It has forbidden her the offices of the church and at times an entrance within its doors. It has denied her independent thought, declaring her a secondary creation for man's use to whom alone it has made her responsible. It has anathematized her sex, teaching her to feel shame for the very fact of her being. It has not been content with proclaiming a curse upon her creative attributes, but has thrust the sorrows and expiations of man's curse upon her, and in doing these things the church has wrought her own ruin. A religious revolution of the most radical kind, has even now assumed such proportions as to nearly destroy the basic creeds of various sects, and undermine the whole fabric of Christendom. It everywhere exists, although neither the world or the church seem to realize the magnitude of its proportions. As a legitimate result of two opposing forces, a crisis in the life of the church is at hand, nay, even upon it. While we see it making organized effort for extension of power and entire control of the state, we also find great increase of radical thought. And development of individual conscience and individual judgment with thought no longer bound by fear of everlasting punishment, mankind will cease to believe unproved assertions. Simply because made by a class of men under assumed authority from God. Reason will be used, mankind will seek for truth come whence it may, led where it, will, and with our own Lucretia Mott, will accept, truth for authority and not authority for truth. In knocking at the door of political rights, woman is severing the last link between church and state, the church must lose that power it has wielded with changing force since the days of Constantine, ever to the injury of freedom and the world. The immeasurable injustice to woman, and her sufferings under Christianity, her intellectual, moral and spiritual servitude will never be understood until life with its sorrow shall be open to our vision in a sphere more refined than the present one. The superstitions of the church, the miseries of woman, her woes, tortures, burnings, rackings and all the brutalities she has endured in the church, the state, the family, under the sanction of Christianity, would be incredible had we not the most undeniable evidence of their existence, not alone in the past but as shown by the teachings, laws and customs of the present time. 578 She has suffered under a theology which extended its rule not only to her civil and political relations, 
but to her most insignificant domestic and personal concerns, regulating the commerce of husband and wife, of parent and child. Of master and servant, even prescribing her diet and dress, her education and her industries. Edmund Noble speaks in like manner of the ancient Russians under the tyrannical provisions of the Greek Church, saying, clearly, such a system of theocratic supervision and direction as this is compatible only with the lowest possible spiritual condition of the subject, or the lowest possible conception of God. Possessing no proof of its premises, the Church has ever fostered unintelligent belief. To doubt her unverified assertion has ever been declared an unpardonable sin. The supreme effort of the Church, being maintenance of power, it is but recently that woman has been allowed to read history for herself, or having read it, dared to draw her own conclusions from its premises. Ignorance and falsehood created a sentiment in accord with themselves, crushing all her aspirations. In the family, man still decides the rights and duties of the wife, as of old. As legislator and judge, he still makes and executes class laws. In the church, he yet arrogates to himself the interpretation of the Bible. Still claims to be an exponent of the divine will, that grandest lesson of the Reformation, the right of private interpretation of the scriptures, not yet having been conceded to woman. The premises upon which the Church is based being radically false, it is a necessary corollary that its conclusions must be equally false, and this, most especially in everything relating to woman. Trained from infancy by the Church to a belief in woman's inferiority, and incapacity for self-government, men of the highest station have not hesitated to organize societies in opposition to her just demands. As early as 1875, an anti-woman's franchise association was formed in London, under name of Association for Protecting the Franchise from the Encroachment of Women, Honorable Mr. Bovary, a leading opponent of woman's suffrage in the House of Commons, being its chairman. Among the promoters of the movement were Sir Henry James, formerly Attorney General, for the Crown, Honorable Mr. Childers, late First Lord of the Admiralty, Mr. Claflin and Mr. Leathers, correspondent of the New York Tribune. Since this period, a number of women distinguished as the wives of have petitioned legislative bodies for protection against freedom for themselves, and all others of their sex. In asking that legislatures shall not recognize woman's self-governing right. The deepest depth of degradation is reached when the slave not only declares against his own freedom, but strives to tighten the bonds of fellow slaves. And the most cruel wrong resulting from such slavery is the destruction of self-respect in the enslaved, as shown by the course of these women petitioners. The protective theory reached its lowest depth for woman by an attack upon her already vested rights of the ballot, in the former territory, now state of Washington, on the Pacific coast, in case of Nevada M. Bloomer, a woman, against John Wood and others, to have the women of that territory deprived of their already existing right of suffrage. 579 In line with the general opposition to the enfranchisement of woman, men of even the most liberal tendencies declare that her political freedom will be used to sustain the church. Apparently forgetting that man alone has placed the church in power and that man alone holds it in power. And proof of man's complicity is even greater than this. Despite what is said of the larger church membership of women, the most noted modern evangelist, Moody, recently declared that, he found men tenfold, aye, and hundredfold, more receptive of his preaching than women. While speaking in Farwell Hall, Chicago, 1886, he said, For fifteen years I have preached to women in the afternoon and very often as near as I could, have preached the same sermon to men at night. And in ninety-nine cases out of a hundred have had five times more result in preaching to men than to women. This pseudo-argument, as to woman's susceptibility to church teaching, brought up by the enemies of her freedom, possesses no more real value than the pseudo-political argument sometimes presented in opposition to woman's admission into active politics. That is, her emotional temperament. To one who has been present at four great presidential nominating conventions and several large state conventions, knowledge upon this point is practical. When one has seen a cordon of police enforced by the mayor upon the platform, protecting the officers of such convention, while its members, standing upon seats, stamped, shouted, gesticulated, threatened with revolvers. 
acting more like uncaged wild beasts than like men 580 when one has witnessed the wildest enthusiasm at the mention of a name, the waving of flags, of hats, of handkerchiefs, the shaking of umbrellas, chairs, canes, with violent stamping. Amid a hubbub of indistinguishable voices, all shouting. Screaming so loud that people for blocks away are roused from slumber 581 in a fright of a fire, or the approach of an ungovernable mob such objections to woman's freedom as her emotions fall to their lowest value. In church and in state, man has exhibited the wildest passions, the most ungovernable frenzy has shown himself less controlled by reason than possible, for woman under the most adverse circumstances. Judaism, and its offspring, Christianity, show the results of the patriarchate in some of its most degenerate forms. Industrial servitude, educational restrictions, legal thraldom, political slavery, false religious teachings, are but a portion of the evils existing under its most enlightened forms. And equally with the more pronounced polygamy and infanticide they show a total perversion of moral ideas. Woman dearly pays for the rights she has secured. Labor opposes, in less pay for the same work. Literature, at first welcoming her only through the cookbook, next compelled her to conceal her sex under a male pseudonym, in order that her writings might be received with the same respect as those of man. Art has given her similar experiences, and while today admitting her to the same advantage of study with man, yet compels her to pay twice the price for the same instructions. The careful student of history will discover that Christianity has been of very little value in advancing civilization, but has done a great deal toward retarding it. 582. Civilization, a recognition of the rights of others at every point of contact, has been carried forward by means of rebellion against church teaching and church authority. The experience of science is familiar to all, even school children quoting Galileo and Dr. Faust. What are called reformations in religion, the work of Huss, of Luther, of the Waldenses, the Huguenots, are equally familiar instances to the youngest student, of rebellion against the church. These and a myriad of others known to the historian, have all been brought about by refusal to accept the authority of the church as final. The peasant war, in France, the struggles of what Tyler and of Hampton in England, the French and the American revolutions looking toward equality of rights. And a thousand minor forms of political progress have all been opposed by the church as rebellions against its teachings, yet all have been marked steps in civilization. The church and civilization are antipodal. One means authority, the other freedom, one means conservatism, the other progress, one means the rights of God as interpreted by the priesthood, the other the rights of humanity as interpreted by humanity. Civilization advances by free thought, free speech, free men. The uprising of the women of all peoples in assertion of their common humanity with man, is exemplification of that fact recognized in the Declaration of Independence, that while patient endurance of wrongs to which persons are accustomed, always long born rather than by change perhaps to meet evils they know not of, shows its absolutely certain ultimate effect, no matter how long delayed, in rebellion. A time comes in the history of souls, as of nations, when forbearance ceases to be a virtue, and self-respecting life is only to be retained through defiance of and rebellion against existing customs. The soul must assert its own supremacy or die. It is not one woman, or the women of one nation that have thus suddenly shown desire to rule themselves to, act for themselves alone. A strange identity of thought pervades all parts of the world India, China, Japan, Russia and all of Europe, North and South America, the vast continents of the southern seas and the isles thereof, and even barbaric Africa. All events proof of the wide psychic undercurrent which seething through women's souls, is overthrowing the civilizations built upon the force principles of the patriarchate, and will soon reinstate the reign of truth and justice. During those long ages of priestly, intolerance, of domestic and governmental tyranny, in which women seemed to accept the authority of the priest as that of God, there still existed a consciousness hardly perceptible to herself. That she was an independent being to whom by virtue of her humanity all opportunities in life belonged. From century to century mothers transmitted this scarcely developed perception to daughters, until suddenly within the past fifty years, these dominant ideas woke to thought. 
And the women of all nations began to proclaim their same right to self-control as that claimed by man. It is impossible to write of the church without noticing its connection with the great systems of the world, during its course of life. The history of Christendom is the history of the myriad institutions which have arisen through its teachings, or that have been sustained by its approval. The world has not grown wise under it, except with a wisdom that is leading the purest humanitarian thought in a direction contrary to its footsteps. Slavery and prostitution, persecutions for heresy, the Inquisition with its six hundred modes of torture, the destruction of learning, the oppression of science, the systematized betrayal of confiding innocence. The recognized and unrecognized polygamy of man, the denial to woman of a right to herself, her thought, her wages, her children, to a share in the government which rules her, to an equal part in religious institutions, all these and a myriad more. Are parts of what is known as Christian civilization. Not has the Church ever been the leader in great reforms. During the anti-slavery conflict, the American Church was known as, the bulwark of American slavery. Its course continues the same in every great contest with wrong. A Memorial History of the American Episcopal Church, an extensive work in two volumes of 700 pages each, published within the past few years, devotes but seven pages to, the attitude of the Church during the Civil War and the general refusal of the Church to take part in the great struggle for national life, is referred to with complacent satisfaction. Penitentiaries and prisons, asylums and reformatories, all institutions of a repressive character which the Church prides herself as having built up, are no less evil than the convents, monasteries and religious orders belonging to it. They have all risen through perversion of nature. Crimes and criminals are built up and born because of the great wrong first done to mothers, they are the offspring of church and state. Science now declares crime to be a disease, but it has not yet discovered the primal cause of this disease. It is an inheritance from centuries of legalized crime against woman, of which the church in its teachings is prime factor. Woman will gain nothing by a compromising attitude toward the church, by attempt to excuse its great wrong toward her sex, or by palliation of its motives. On the contrary, a stern reference to facts, keeping the face of the world turned toward its past teachings, its present attitude, is her duty. Wrongs of omission equal in magnitude those of commission. Advance for woman is too well established, woman has had too much experience, has borne too much ridicule, misrepresentation and abuse to now hesitate in an attack upon the stronghold of her oppression the Church. She possesses too full knowledge of its subtle touch upon civil law to dare leave it alone. It has become one of woman's first duties, one of her greatest responsibilities, to call public attention to its false doctrines and false teachings in regard to the origin, condition and subjection of woman. She has engaged in too many battles, whether too many storms to longer hesitate in exposure of its stupendous crimes toward one half of humanity. Let those who fear, hide themselves, if they will, until the storm is past. Let those who dare, defiantly rejoice that they are called upon to bear still more, in order that woman may be free. A brighter day is to come for the world, a day when the intuitions of woman's soul shall be accepted as part of humanity's spiritual wealth, when force shall step backward, and love, in reality, rule the teachings of religion. And may woman be strong in the ability and courage necessary to bring about this millennial time. The world is full of signs of the near approach of this period. As never before is there an arousing sense of something deeper, holier in religion than the Christian Church has given. The world has seemingly awaited the advent of heroic souls who once again should dare all things for the truth. The woman who possesses love for her sex, for the world, for truth, justice and right, will not hesitate to place herself upon record as opposed to falsehood, no matter under what guise of age or holiness it appears. A generation has passed since the great struggle began, but not until within ten years has woman dared attack upon the various stronghold of her oppression, the Church. The state, agent and slave of the Church, has so long united with it in suppression of woman's intelligence, has so long preached of power to man alone, that it has created an inherited tendency, an inborn line of thought toward repression. Bent in this line before his birth, man still unwittingly thinks of woman as not quite his equal, 
and it requires a new creation of mind to change his thought. A second generation has arisen, in whom some slight inherited tendencies toward recognition of a woman's right to herself are seen. In the next generation this line of inherited thought will have become stronger, both church and state more fully recognizing woman's inherent right to share in all the opportunities of life. But at what cost to all who have taken part in the great struggle? Has woman no wrongs to avenge upon the church? As I look backward through history I see the church everywhere stepping upon advancing civilization, hurling woman from the plane of natural rights where the fact of her humanity had placed her, and through itself, and its control over the state. In the doctrine of revealed rights everywhere teaching an inferiority of sex. A created subordination of woman to man, making her very existence a sin, holding her accountable to a diverse code of morals from man, declaring her possessed of fewer rights in church and in state. Her very entrance into heaven made dependent upon some man to come as mediator between her and the Savior it has preached, thus crushing her personal, intellectual and spiritual freedom. Looking forward, I see evidence of a conflict more severe than any yet fought by Reformation or science. A conflict that will shake the foundations of religious belief, tear into fragments and scatter to the winds the old dogmas upon which all forms of Christianity are based. It will not be the conflict of man with man upon rights and systems. It will not be the conflict of science upon church theories regarding creation and eternity, it will not be the light of biology illuminating the hypothesis of the resurrection of the body. But it will be the rebellion of one half of the church against those theological dogmas upon which the very existence of the church is based. In no other country has the conflict between natural and revealed rights been as pronounced as in the United States, and in this country where the conflict first began, we shall see its full and final development. During the ages, no rebellion has been of like importance with that of woman against the tyranny of church and state, none has had its far-reaching effects. We note its beginning. Its progress will overthrow every existing form of these institutions, its end will be a regenerated world. The end.